Good morning to you. It's six o'clock on Sunday, the 31st of March. Today, Happy Easter Sunday. Leaders and religious figures celebrate across the world with the King set to join the rest of the royal family in Windsor. And as you wake up to presents from the Easter Bunny this morning, what's the best way to make sure you can eat your chocolate guilt-free? Also today, a new mega poll has revealed a dire tale for the Conservative Party as they reach a record low, <coughs> with even the Prime Minister predicted to lose his seat. Um, with clocks springing forward, an hour to mark the beginning of British summertime, we'll be looking at the best ways to feel fresh this morning. Good morning. It was a thrilling day of Premier League action yesterday as Manchester United took the lead six minutes into added time, only for Brentford to equalise. We look ahead to the Manchester City v Arsenal game, of course, later on. And there was a Cambridge double in the 169th varsity both race. Good morning. The clocks have sprung forward overnight, but for some of us, especially during Easter Monday, the weather is certainly not looking very spring-like at all. Find out all the information with me in a little bit. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Dawn Neeson, and this is Breakfast on GB News. And just to remind you, it is one minute past six, just in case you forgot to change your clocks overnight. And you, <laughs> isn't it? It's very confusing. Do you know what? It drives me mad. It I, drives me I just, mad. I just want them to stop it. Why can't we just live on British summertime? Oh, GMT I'd live on. Oh, would you? Well, yeah. see, this is the problem. We'll have to have a referendum on it and then we'll be debating it for years to come. Yeah. But, I mean, why, I mean we do it. It was a German thing. The Germans invented it. Do you know that? What? The, ch the change? The, 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 yeah. yeah. Because they, they, they convinced people it was a way they were going to win the war. And look how that ended. Oh. So you see, I, do, I, I sort of think we should. St if we did stay to one, it should be GMT. Otherwise, there would be nowhere that actually worked on Greenwich Mean Time, would there? Greenwich Mean Time it, would only be theoretical. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Well, I don't. I don't like. Okay, when, when you're a morning person, when you get up early, in any case, it's so dark in the mornings, and then you're tired, and it's still broad daylight. I was tired. This. I was tired this morning. Well, that's because you had a wild, exciting the... night. It's because it was, in effect, two o'clock in the morning getting up. Yeah. When you... I get up at two o'clock and put this full face of makeup on just yeah. for you. Yeah. And for you. You don't want to see what it looks like without it, believe me. We've all seen it on Instagram. You look gorgeous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about that. Sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, look, happy Easter, most importantly. Uh, people up and down the country today will be celebrating. Families uh, either heading to church or perhaps just having lunch or enjoying their Easter chocolates. Oh, that sounds lovely. And our politicians have also released their Easter messages with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying, for many of us in the UK, Easter is a chance to pause and reflect and an opportunity to spend some precious time with our families and a moment to enjoy the start of spring. So this weekend, let me wish you all a very happy and peaceful Easter. Um, so Keir Starmer's Easter message says the Easter story is one of hope and renewal, of overcoming adversity and light prevailing over darkness. As families and friends gather to celebrate, we turn our thoughts towards new beginnings, our future and how things can change for the better. Mm. Well, that was subtle. <laughs> well, one's looking back and the other one's looking forward. I wonder which one's doing which. Yes. Mm. And, of course, Easter is one of the holiest days on the Christian calendar. It is celebrated all over the world. So, thrilled to say, joining us now is Father Fadi Diab, rector of St Andrew's Church, located in the city of Ramallah in the West Bank, only 15 kilometres away from Jerusalem. Uh, Father, good morning to you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and wishing you a very... Very, very happy Easter. Um, how, how, how's things where you are at the moment? We're waking up on this Easter morning and there is so much conflict um, and strife in the world, but in particularly where you are. Good morning to you and uh, happy Easter uh, to you and to all our friends in the UK. Um, well, as, as you mentioned, uh, this is a time uh, when uh, the Palestinian uh, Christian Church uh, celebrate Easter in the Holy Land um, with uh, sadness uh, and uh, challenges that continues to uh, to uh, prevail in the life of the Palestinian people. 
despite despite all the sadness, uh, the Christians celebrate Easter with uh, joy and hope that this uh, day uh, will uh, will bring change. That Christ's resurrection uh, is uh, the prevalence of life uh, over death and hope over despair. Is there? I mean, I know it's it, it's cold comfort to many, but the idea. I mean, one thing which we learn over Easter weekend, of course, is that sometimes suffering is necessary. Mm. Well, suffering is part of what it means to be human. Um, it is not God's intent for God's will. Uh, and that, that is why uh, I believe that the Christmas message is uh, the prevalence of life over suffering and the end of suffering, the prevalence of light uh, uh, over darkness. Um, I don't. I don't believe that the killing of thirty-two thousand Palestinians and the injury of more than eighty thousand people is necessary. Uh, unfortunately, this is part of human uh, um, human pride and human power. Um, however, God uses that suffering, uh, uses that suffering to transform it into uh, joy uh, through the through the Easter message. Um, it is very sad that the uh, Palestinian community, especially those in Gaza who have been trapped um, in uh, the sanctuaries of the Catholic and Orthodox churches now for uh, six months, um, for them, uh, Easter is a hope that this too will, uh, will, will end, that God, uh, God's word is the last word, not the human word, not the human power. And this is, this is the resurrection. This is the message of the resurrection, that at the end, it's God's word that prevails. How do, we, how do we take hope, though, do you think, Father, this Easter? When, we, when is, you've mentioned the, the horrific figures mm. of Palestinian casualties in all of this, and, I'm, you know, there's, th there's no argument here how horrific that is. But all of this driven by the, the hate in the hearts of those people in Hamas who, who started this, who planned the attack on Israel, in October. We, we are in a world where hate seems to be getting more prominent, I'm afraid to say. Well, I, I totally agree with you that uh, we are experiencing a, a rise in, in, in hate uh, and hate speech and hate actions. Uh, and, and this is very frightening to our uh, humanity and our creation. Uh, I think the way we experience uh, hope uh, in the midst of this is uh, to believe uh, in the power of love, to, be, to believe in the power of God to transform hearts, to transform hate into love, to transform our uh, relationship with the other into one of a constructive relationship towards humanity. That is that is the meaning of, of Easter today. That's the meaning of the resurrection. How the human person is transformed through the power of God into a new human being. That kind of transformation, what we need in our context and in our world today. Uh, uh, very wise words yeah, indeed. Uh, Father Diab, good to see you this morning. Thank you very, uh, much. very happy and Easter, Easter to, you. to Thank all you. of you. Thank you. Mm, well, I mean, that's quite strong. It is, isn't it? It is very strong. Unfortunately, we're running out of time there. I, I just, I mean, because so many people you talk to these days are, are lo literally losing faith in religion because of the conflicts it causes around the world. And I yeah. know religion has always caused, caused divide and conflict. But it just seems so it's so common now that, you know, hate is winning over love. And it's just so, at Easter weekend, it's, it's just so depressing. It is. And what, what, uh, what ties into that slightly? There's been all this hoo-ha, and I know some of you have been upset by, for example, uh, the, the Ramadan lights in London and things over Easter weekend. And I get it. I get it. But actually, if you talk to a lot of religious leaders, including a lot of vicars and priests, 
that they work within their communities with interfaith groups. Yes, um, yes. There's, a, there's an awful lot of that go, goes on. Yeah. It seems to be people who perhaps aren't necessarily regular church goers so there's a, who the, get very upset about the Ramadan lights, whereas maybe a local vicar may, may have got on to the gone to the turning on of the lights well, or something. I mean, it happens all the time. It does. There's a brilliant, brilliant synagogue near where my friend lives in North London, and at the end of the Ram Ramadan day of fasting, they hold a, a meal, um, and they invite all the local community there. So you have mm. Jewish people, you have Muslim people, all celebrating together. Mm. And it's such a lovely thing to do. If only, oh, God, how much of a, oh, my God, let's all have a hug, do I sound? But if only we could be more like that. Well, there is more, it's certainly within religion that there is more in common than divides us. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so just if you, you know, don't get angry about things like that. It's Easter. It's Easter Sunday. Eat eggs, spend time with those you love, and carry on watching Stephen and I, obviously. Um, right, but we are staying with Easter. Um, the message in today's ever-increasing secular society. Churches are finding it harder than ever to have their message heard, and congregations are indeed shrinking. So what role should churches be playing in our modern society? Our Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beatty went to an outreach ministry in Belfast that deals with addiction and homelessness. We go out and, and reach people in society who are broken, uh, many of them living on the streets, and when, when they live on the streets, 99% of them then get addicted to drugs uh, in some way. We bring them in and we offer them hope. Uh, the hope is found in Jesus Christ. Teen Challenge can't change anyone, but Jesus Christ can. Uh, and we, we make that plain to, to, to the folk uh, that there is a way out of addiction and there is a way out of the darkness and there is a way out of the pain and that there is hope. Our motto is putting hope within the reach of every addict and the hope, which is the name of this building, the hope is Jesus. Pastor Brian Madden leads Teen Challenge in Belfast and points to the need for a sense of belonging and belief. Everyone that comes in here belongs. They don't necessarily go to church, but they love coming here. They love coming to a Christian organization. They, they never, ever, ever refuse prayer. I just prayed with a young man there five minutes ago. I think it's the first time anyone has prayed for him in his life. When churches such as this one were first built, they were so much more than a place to worship. They projected power and social standing. They were a communication hub for the community. But do they still have the same relevance today? Buildings are, for their very nature, they're buildings that at one time could have fulfilled a, a very important function, and maybe they don't now. So if you think back to the earlier centuries, walking into a, a church building could have been a warm and comfortable space, a place where there was a sense of community, where they didn't have other grand buildings. Imagine walking into a cathedral and the high ceilings, the stained glass windows. The grandeur of it all just spoke of the majesty of God. Many churches are funding the Hope Project, and evangelist Keith Mitchell says churches may change, but their message must remain. So a core principle shouldn't change, and our method should always be one in terms of what is the culture saying around us and how do we engage in that culture in a way that we are, we are living out love and grace, but also we're embracing truth. We're not compromising on truth. And I think the church has a radical message of hope to still bring to the world today, and we do that in lots of different ways. So you might be looking at an old building now and say, you know, how is this relevant? But it's from the cafe at the side, and when people come in here on a Thursday night to worship, they see something contemporary, they see something new, they see something fresh. And in the world today, people need hope, and the church champions hope more than any other religious organization in the world. Doogie BD, GB News, Belfast. We have got to get out and about there and do good. That's what and the church should be doing. I mean, that's that's... That's what it is it's about, isn't it? It's helping people. Yeah, and for those who look down on, on people who maybe have a drug addiction or all the rest of it, Mary Magdalene is all I'd say. Yeah, no, quite. Yeah, a prostitute. 
Yeah, well, funny enough, talking of that, I used to do a little bit of charity work in the East End of London uh, with, with fallen women, as they used to be called. Oh. And, you know, all most of them wanted were sanitary products. Yeah. They were living rough. They didn't have the basics like that. You've got, you know, this is... You, you've got to reach out to people. Yeah. Um, preach the gospel at all times and, if necessary, use words. Yeah. Exactly. Kind words. Oh, my God, we sound very, sort of, like... Very religious. Very, very woke and cuddly this morning I hope as well. my dick is watching. She'll be delighted. Yeah, she will. Um, yeah. But, no, but there's a lot of... Let's, you know, let's concentrate <clears throat> on good... It is, it is, and it's not necessarily woke or, or weak or lefty or righty or anything else to be kind. What is wrong with being nice to one another? I don't know, cos you look at social media now... And if you're one of those people who do it, maybe this is a day to reflect on why you do it. Yeah, Vickers just messaged. <laughs> yeah. uh, but send, who, who put such nasty things on social media? Bitter, nasty things. Oh. And I, why would you do it? I don't understand why... Well, get, GB Views or GB News, if That's you right. understand this, why do you wake up in the morning, pick your phone up and go, oh, right, I know what I'm going to do today. I'm going to be really horrible to whoever it happens to be. And, you, and, uh, if, and if you don't... If people don't like me, well, you, you don't have to like yeah, me. Yeah, you're bigger to You don't have to like me. I, you know, that's perfectly fine. <clears throat> Why then would you have to uh, copy me into that message to say, I can't stand Stephen Dixon? Um, why would you do that? There's an, there's an, there's an innate nastiness which well, we, we seem to let out on social media. But, yeah, well, would they say it to your face? I don't know, probably not. <laughs> Let Stephen know, GB News. You, to, GB you don't have to like me. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not in this world for everyone to like me. Um, so that's fine. But why do you need to say you don't like someone? I don't know. I like you. Odd. I like you too. Thank you. Well, that's that sorted then. Uh, right, should we have a look at some of the other stories heading into the newsroom? It's 6 16. It is indeed. Uh, churches are being warned by the Home Secretary to not allow asylum seekers to exploit the system by converting to Christianity. James Cleverly says there is a real difference between welcoming a new member of the congregation and vouching for a person in an asylum tribunal. The Metropolitan Police have arrested <laughs> four people suspected of planning to disrupt the um, Oxford-Cambridge boat race on the Thames yesterday. The force says it was made aware that protesters um, were planning to cause disruption, but officers were able to take swift action to intercept the plans, apparently. Uh, as you'll be aware, probably by now, uh, Cambridge claimed a double yesterday, uh, but rowers were warned not to jump into the water. Um, because of high levels of E. coli. Mm. And a new video has been released in the United States showing the inside of the container ship that hit the Baltimore Bridge, causing it to collapse in the river. The footage released by the National Transport Safety Board is one of the first glimpses inside the vessel that collided with the Francis Scott Key Bridge on Tuesday. It shows investigators inside the boat inspecting damage as they arrive to download the ship's data. Crews were still surveying damage as of midday on Friday. A huge crane, which can lift up to 1,000 tonnes, has been put in place to start hauling debris out of the water. Now, in his Easter message, the Prime Minister welcomed the opportunity to pause and reflect as he gears up for a general election. Hmm. OK, but a new uh, poll in the... It's a mega poll, actually. Why it's a big are you calling one. it a mega poll? Because it, they ask a lot of people. You know, normally polls are like, we chat to 2,000 people, but this is, I think, 15,000, so it's quite a lot of people. Oh, I see. Yeah, mega. I think so. Anyway, new mega poll in the Times newspaper has revealed the Conservatives are on track for the uh, worst election results ever. <laughs> uh, well, it found the Tories could win fewer than 100 seats, Labour having a predicted uh, majority... Of 286. I think it was a whopping majority when Boris Johnson got 80. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a whopping whopping. 286 seat majority. That's literally everybody, isn't that? The problem with that is, of course, is that would mean the Labour Party could do anything it wanted. And that's why, who was it the other day saying to Chopper um, about, you know, there needs to be a, um, you need to have a strong opposition? For, for democracy's sake, 
you need a strong opposition. That's just sensible, mm. um, which you wouldn't get with that sort of majority. I mean, that's no, there would be no opposition whatsoever, would they? No. And uh, um, well, let's let's get someone intelligent to talk about politics, shall we? Um, political commentator Jonathan Gibson. Jonathan, thank you very much for joining us, and happy Easter to you. Um, it comes to something when even the Tory supporting newspapers like the Sunday Telegraph and the Sunday Times are having a go. And this is a pretty shocking poll, isn't it? Mm, absolutely. And good morning and a happy Easter to the both of you. Yes, this definitely shocked me reading this this morning. The fact that even our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's seat is in danger says a lot about the state of the Conservative Party. And also, I think it's quite common amongst discussion to talk about that the Conservatives are in for a significant defeat. I think the extent to which this poll suggests that they're going to be defeated is still surprising to many people. I mean, 468 MPs is what Labour is estimated to be left with compared to just 98 from the Tory front. We talked about the Conservative landslide against Jeremy Corbyn, but this is really going to be significant and historical in upturning what was previously a very strong Conservative majority. Well, well look, it's democracy and the people should get what they vote for. But as I was saying before, that the problem with something of this size, 286 seat majority, is that it, it has the potential to damage the democratic process, doesn't it, in terms of a government being able to do absolutely whatever it wants? I mean, I think everyone across all ends of the political spectrum will say it's really important to have a stronger opposition for democracy. And it is a concern. Unfortunately, for people in the Labour camp, there's nothing they can do about that. And they're possibly quite happy about the fact that we might be able to change some of the uh, policies and some of the trends that are going through politics, which have been throughout the last sort of 13 years under the Conservative leadership. Whether they can do that remains to be seen. But I think it signifies that people are fed up with the current status quo. Um, and, you know, they may face opposition, they may face challenges from backbenchers and MPs who seek to rebel from the party line. But I think ultimately they will have far greater mandate to do and to change what they want. Obviously, it's not an ideal situation and you would want a significant and strong opposition party in order to hold them to account properly. Jonathan, it is a cliche, obviously, that, you know, you, you know a, a, a party that have been in government for as long as the Conservative Party have, people are just going to vote them out because it's the thing to do almost. Uh, but they're not necessarily voting for Labour. Do you think that's the case in this situation again? I think that there's a few different reasons why people are moving away from the Conservatives. I think part of that is the length of time that they've been in power. Part of that has been frustration over key political issues which they've many in the public have felt have been ignored, the leadership tussles which have really weakened mm. the party, whether that was with Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, and people sort of feeling ignored and their voices feeling very much alienated. I think with um, Keir Starmer, there's a bit of push and take. There's people possibly feeling that maybe even if we don't really, really want him, we're not really excited by the prospect of his leadership. He seems like a safe pair of hands, someone who may take into account some of our concerns. And obviously, he's been moving towards sort of the centre ground which has been growing his appeal to many um, across who are not, you know, far far left or even in the Labour Party, and a lot of reluctant, often, often historic sort of conservative um, voters or people that hadn't voted in several years are starting to move towards his party. Um, and I think a lot of people who are on the left are sort of grudgingly going to vote for him, knowing that voting Green or anywhere else would sort of be a bit of a waste. I would argue. Would this effectively, for a period of time at least, kill the far left off? I mean, because there'd be... He wouldn't have to pander to them, he wouldn't have to have a, a far left deputy or anything of anything of that nature at all, would it? The, the whole um, momentum movement would fizzle out, wouldn't it? I mean, I think within his party, he's actually done quite a remarkable job of shutting down the, the far left, as we are seeing right now today in campaigns and in the way in who's allowed to speak... Um, and what the party line is. And I think that's been quite surprising to many in some ways, given that he was serving in uh, Jeremy Corbyn's cabinet. So I think he's already shown that he's willing to do that. I think actually there will be more challenges, if anything, once he seizes power and these people mm. feel like they have the ability to speak because they have you know, got their seats and been represented. So I think there will they'll start, start being more challenges. But obviously the fact that he might have such a landslide will possibly help him to quash some of that. But when you have such a big 
majority, it actually can be incredibly difficult to cater to all those different factions and make sure your party stay happy with you. So it might be an incredibly difficult job, even though it seems on the face of it that it will be quite beneficial for him having such a large majority. Jonathan, just very briefly, we're running out of time, but uh, um, Penny Morden has, in this poll also, Penny Morden is more popular than Rishi Sunak. If they did change leader again, I mean, why not? It's a new week. Um, would that help them? Possibly. I don't think it would help them enough to significantly overturn this majority or do anything really significant, but I don't really see how it could make their position any worse given the sort of dire situation they're currently finding themselves in. Oh, heck. Oh, well, mm. That's the sort of analysis they won't want to hear. Happy Easter, Rishi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jonathan, <laughs> thanks very much indeed. Thank Good to you, see Jonathan. you this morning. I know it must be... If you're a, if you're a die-hard Tory... It must be very frustrating that everyone is sort of predicting the results of the election. Um, you, you're always... I mean, the thing is, I mean, the Tories are almost themselves... I mean, the leadership of the Tory party are almost themselves admitting that it's pretty much a busted flush, aren't they? It's very hard to see how it isn't. Mm. When you look at a poll like that, which doesn't just give Labour a majority, I mean... It... Let's take over the House, basically. I mean, would that be... It? I mean, it's just... It's just unbelievable. And I think I think it would strengthen momentum. And, and remember... It's like, you think it would strengthen momentum? I think it would, I think, because it, I think there will be infighting. Like Angela... But wouldn't you see... My, someone was talking to me about this the other day, and my argument was, well, presumably all this new intake would, at least for 12 months, be absolutely behind their leader. I'd, I'd give it 12 weeks. The way politics are at the well, moment, yeah. I mean... Maybe. And Angela Rayner's there. Hmm... Well, yeah, but she might not be deputy afterwards. No, 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 she might not be, but I think she's, um, she's got more spherical objects than Keir Starmer. Oh, I see. Mm. Mm, good mm. on that, as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. uh, right, let us know what you think about all of that. It's going to be a very interesting election, whatever the outcome in all of this, that's for sure. Um, is it going to be an interesting Easter Sunday weather-wise? <laughs> um, I sort of doubt it. Here's Craig. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well, today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, Western England and Wales, but further east, it's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather great afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland and Northern Ireland but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again 14 or 15 degrees. Into the evening we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday but all the time Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit drier here and in any clear skies we will see a touch of frost. So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall, though. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Still feeling sleepy out there? Remember those clocks sprung forward this morning, but are you springing out of bed? Well, fear no longer if you're not, because we speak to a sleep expert in just a moment. That's coming up next. This is Breakfast on GB News with him, Stephen and me, Dawn. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. 
GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Wondering why you're feeling so tired this morning? Actually, well, I'm not. I'm feeling quite perky. No, you're very perky. perky. This is highly Really annoying, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm not feeling perky this morning. But I know why. Because the clocks went forward, so an hour less sleep. Um, it's probably, we're told, the best weekend for it to happen on. Don't know why. Why? No, I don't get that. I mean, why is it good to lose an hour of sleep ever? No. Any case, but it's not just, you know, feeling a bit grumpy like some people might be this morning. <laughs> but losing the hour of sleep can have a real effect on the roads and an increased uh, risk of accidents due to tiredness. Ah, uh, well, that's a very fair point. Let's mm. talk to sleep expert Dr Lindsay Browning. Good morning to you, Lindsay. Look, nothing we can do about it. Clocks go forward and that's just the way it is. But how do we compensate for that? How do we get the best out of this? Yeah, brilliant. Well, what you said, it's absolutely the best weekend for it to happen because the, be the way to avoid that missing that hour of sleep really is to make sure that you've either gone to bed early last night, if we had a time machine, or you give yourself a lie-in over the next few days. And as long as you're not having to work on Sunday or Easter Monday, you'll be able to get a little bit of catch-up sleep over the next couple of days, enabling you to avoid that hour less. Because, of course, when the clock's change. If you don't, if you go to bed at your normal time and you wake up at your normal wake time, you're going to lose an hour's sleep, which has a, a real impact on tiredness and, as you said, an, an increased risk of road traffic accidents, of heart attacks, all sorts of things due to that, that missed hour that a lot of us will get. <laughs> when, you, <laughs> when you say it's a good weekend, though, Lindsay, um, it, it is and it isn't, because it's also Easter, obviously, and it is the bank holiday. I get why it's good, but there's also lots of chocolate around. And I find messing around with the actual clocks affects your body clock, mm. and I either end up eating too much at the wrong times of day or forgetting to eat completely. It does affect every rhythm in our body, doesn't it? Absolutely. Our circadian rhythm is our internal 24-hour clock. And that's the thing that kind of goes wrong when we change time zones or, or the clock change happens. And when we change our circadian rhythm, when we mess with it, it can affect our metabolism, it affects our hormones that produce our hunger drive, absolutely it will affect our ability to, to choose healthy foods. And as well, if you mm. add to that the fact that you might be a bit sleep deprived, sleep deprived people, people who don't sleep enough hours, tend to eat an additional 300 calories a day, which is quite a lot really. Uh, and of course, we tend to choose when we're sleep deprived foods such as sugary things, chocolate, and yeah, if you're lucky enough to be surrounded by lots of Easter eggs, mm. you're going to definitely reach for those. Mm. What about people? I mean, the, a, a general sort of sleep question, if you like, because there are lots of people who, who struggle on, on a regular basis. What do we do that isn't? And because what I do get a bit fed up of is is all this. So, well, don't don't watch television. Don't don't look at your phone. Don't, your phone. don't know that. But what can we do apart from apart from all that sort of stuff, which people find unavoidable? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, if you do need to use your phone, uh, which of course I'm a, I'm a mum, I can't leave my phone downstairs at night because I need to be able to be on call for things. Just enable night mode, which takes away some of the bright light which affects our sleep. And when the clock's change, so now, this morning, it's really a good idea to make sure you get as much bright light this morning as soon as possible when you wake up, because that's going to help your circadian rhythm, your internal 24 hour clock to move earlier. So then you'll find it easier to fall asleep tonight at the right time and wake up tomorrow morning that earlier time. It's gonna help get you back in track. Lindsay, right. finally, just oh. one question, because I am married mm. to Rip Van Winkle, by the way. If you are tired today, is it sensible to have a little afternoon nap or should you just try and soldier on and, and sleep at bedtime? So an afternoon nap can be amazing for our productivity to help give us a boost in the afternoon, but it needs to be afternoon, so about sort of 12, 1, 2 o'clock, and not later than that, really. And it needs to be not too long. So a 20-minute power nap around just after lunchtime, after you've had maybe a bit of lamb at Easter Sunday, mm. would be absolutely perfect to give you a bit of a boost to get you through to the evening and then your circadian rhythm will get back in line so that come Tuesday, work time, you'll be back on track and sleeping well and feeling bright, awake and alert. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you, Dr Lindsay. And a very happy Easter to you and yours. Thank you. I have a power nap. Doesn't work, have, does it? I have a power nap. It's a three-hour power nap. That's not a nap. <laughs> most, That's most a night's nap. sleep. <laughs> Honestly, I can't. This whole power nap thing, if you can do it, brilliant. And, and Dr Lindsay is absolutely right. Yeah. But I can't do it. I can't go to sleep and wake up 20 minutes later. I'm out cold. For three hours. Three, at least three hours. I'm lucky if I get three hours a night. Are you really? I, just don't, I, I think I'm a bit more Margaret Thatcher, but she did go <laughs> a bit mad, didn't she? And so, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Aiden's waving hey, at me. Yeah, what are you waving at? Well, I, well, good morning, everyone, first of all. I did a piece with a sleep expert in oh. my um, previous job, and he was just telling me how the eight hours thing is a bit of a myth. Oh. So this, ha this is how, as it, it pertains nice. to sport. I need more than eight <laughs> hours. Because he said, he said that, you know, you can go to... He said be, one of the biggest reasons for, for lack of good sleep quality is things like leaving your heat on overnight because you wake up dehydrated. And so you're not ready oh. for the day. You may have slept the number of hours, the requisite number of hours, but you're not going to be ready for the day. The football is a it was a nightmare for them because they didn't train well enough if they're dehydrated. Uh, the last the last light you see before you go to bed or wake up should be natural light if possible. Obviously easier in the morning than it is in the evening, especially in the winter winter months. But also the eight, eight hours thing. What happens when you go and do a sleep consultation for Real Madrid or Barcelona? They have siestas. They sleep in the middle of the day. It's mm. not they don't have the same they don't have the same sleep pattern as we no. do over here. Body clock. No. Oh, well, no one's going to be having a kip this afternoon, though, are they? It's a bit of a big football match coming on. Well, it's yeah. I mean, look, these matches between these top twos and top threes in the last couple of seasons, they're, they're almost like Super Bowl levels. This will have a global television audience. Stephen, uh, Arsenal going to Manchester City, looking to exercise a few demons. They went there 11 months ago. They had frittered away an eight-point lead. They went there and they were literally steamrolled. Do you remember, Dawn? They were lost 4-1 at yeah, Manchester yeah. City on the way to the United City winning the treble. Question marks over the summer. Are Arsenal ever going to have the mental fortitude, the courage, the bottle, the determination to see this job through, having made, made improvements year on year? Today is a litmus test because I think they've won eight games in a row, so they can't really be in much better form, Stephen, going to this uh, game. But we are talking about the treble winners. We're talking about the manager of Arsenal, who was a, he was a sorcerer's apprentice because he was, he was the coach at Manchester City under Pep Guardiola. He still rates him as the best coach in the world. Then you've got Liverpool, the third, the third cog in the wheel, because... They're, they're going first in this, though, aren't they? Well, the they are, first. they are. So they could, they could go top anyway, and they'll be hoping and praying. Just as Arsenal were three weeks ago, they'd be hoping and praying that the other two draw, because that leaves the door open for them. And as, as I say, we all crave excitement in football, we all crave excitement in life. And now we've got three teams going at it, hammer and tong, for the title... Even last season, when, when Arsenal fell away, there was still the last month, it was a little bit processional. Manchester City had done mm, the job. Yeah. All their eyes were on, were on Europe and a domestic trophy for the FA Cup, of course. So it looks like we're going to have a three-way tussle and it could be memorable when we look back. OK. Um, can we talk Man United? Yes. Um, because, I mean, they, who did they beat the other week? Oh, Liverpool. I was and there. That, and that was, oh, that was the one you went to, isn't it? Yeah, well, so you, they produced... a corporate gig. And it was a great performance. It was great. That to... So how many times do we talk about Man United and mentality? because yesterday they took the lead six minutes into added time. So they've had 13 days rest. All managers moan about, oh, our players are fatigued, they haven't mm. had a month. Well, we talk, about, we talk about sleep, we're on the sub sub mm. subject of rest again, aren't we? 13 days going into this game, they take the lead six minutes into added time. Now, 
notwithstanding the fact that they'd conceded 31 shots on goal in the game. That means a shot on goal they conceded every three minutes. That's not sustainable for a top club. So they got away with it. In fact, when, it, when Brentford equalised in the ninth minute of added time, Thomas Frank was saying, I'd almost, the Brentford manager, I'd almost lost faith in the football god. He thought it was so unjust that his team hadn't equalised. But if you're Man United, you take the lead six minutes into added time, you've got to close that out. Any level of elite sport will tell you, any, any person involved in elite, elite sport will tell you that. And so they'll be absolutely kicking themselves on that because they've lost two points and they're still in sixth place. But when we talk about mentality, psychology, that's what the new owners will be looking at. They're all about that, especially Sir Dave Brailsford with his involvement mm. in British cycling. They'll be looking at it and thinking, can this bloke see this side over, this, over the line? Too many times this season, Stephen, he's failed. Mm. OK, oh, talking about getting over the line. <laughs> Um, the team in blue ran in, uh, won in the boat race yesterday. <laughs> no, I was talking, I wasn't watching it. I, I must mother, admit, I missed it. I was talking to my mother and she said, oh, the, the boat race was good, um, the team in green won. Yeah, well, it's like, what? Yeah, but it's kind a, of a turquoise thing, duck egg, isn't it? Duck egg it's blue. Like, yeah. Duck egg blue. I'd say so, yeah. yeah. duck egg, that's the word, yeah. We agreed on that, yeah? Yeah. All right, the side in duck egg blue uh, won. But, listen, it was... Or Cambridge, as we call them, professionally. Exactly. Well, we, we, we chatted yesterday, we had two rows on two yeah. previous winners, and we were talking about the build-up have been like, you know, we'd never seen anything like this before because of the pollution in the water, the levels of E. coli. Well, the, the Oxford cat, the opposite... Well, one of the Oxford rowers yesterday, Leonard Jenkins, came out yesterday and said, look, I nearly didn't race this morning because I was throwing up. We had members of our team. We didn't say so beforehand because we didn't, want, we didn't want to compromise the integrity of the race and we didn't want to take anything away from the fact that Cambridge went on to, went to win. But I think th up to three or four of their, of their rowers of their team were suffering from E. coli. Oh. So it wasn't a myth. Because they've been training it in was the Thames. They've been say, it's training, training there and we saw those, those optics, didn't we, yesterday? Oh, I've, yeah. About the water. I mean, I almost didn't think it was real, but I mean, clearly, clearly it was. But I mean, the water was yellow. Yeah, it was absolutely good. horrible. And the teams took the precautions covering their blisters. They didn't step inside the water with, uh, without the appropriate footwear. Normally, the cocks of the winning team gets thrown into the, to the water. That didn't happen yesterday in the women's team either because that went on two, two hours before and it was a Cambridge double, as, we, uh, as mm. we said. But, you know, that victory for Cambridge really overshadowed by the problems in the river, and it looked absolutely God, filthy. That. That's disgusting. That's all we're talking about. Thames Water, yeah. Thames Water say they're looking to rectify the problem, but I can't help oh. them when they've caused it themselves. Well, yeah, they're not in the best <laughs> place yeah, when to rectify no. anything. Yeah, no, when really. they've got time to stop <coughs> counting their bonuses and dividends have yes, played themselves. that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, all right, Aidan, thank, thank you. you. We'll see you a little bit see later bit. on. Right, uh, still to come, we'll be going through the stories making the news with Emma Wolfe and Tom Slater. That's coming up next. This is Breakfast on GB News with Stephen and Dawn. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this as backup is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if it would destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had to eat off a of primus <laughs> Dave and things. This is, again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country?
Um, it's 6.44. Let's have a look at some of the newspapers this morning. Start with the Times. Sunday Times uh, has the Conservatives heading for their worst electoral defeat in history, according to what they're calling a new mega poll. Mm. Meanwhile, the Mail leads with Angela Rayner branded a hypocrite for targeting the Prime Minister's wife over tax affairs. Uh, in the Sunday Telegraph, <coughs> a warning today about how Labour's net zero plans could leave Britain at the mercy of China. And the Observer leads with the UK's previously undisclosed legal advice to Israel. The Sunday Mirror has a friendship between the Princess of Wales and Giovanna Fletcher, who's um, a winner of I'm a Celebrity. You didn't sound that confident in that bit. <laughs> Never heard of her. Who? <laughs> Who? No, I'm sure... I'm sure it's fine. Uh, joining us now to go through the papers is writer and columnist and journalist Emma Wolfe and Ezra Spite. Tom Slater, thank Morning. you very much. Happy Easter Morning. to you both. Happy Easter. Easter. Looking remarkably refreshed, considering we've stolen an hour off you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, the universe has stolen an hour. Yeah. Where's wow. it gone? It's very bad. We you want um, it back. Emma, can we have a look at the Sunday yeah. Times yeah. and this mega poll, which yeah. is frankly... Yeah. Shocking. Well, I was going to say it's shocking, but it's sort of not. We know this, but it's devastating, isn't it? It's devastating what? for the Conservatives. It literally puts the seal on all hopes. You don't come back from a majority. Labour are not going to lose the next election on this footing. This is a poll of 15,000 people. This gives the Tories 98 seats. It gives Labour uh, uh, 468 seats, a majority of 286. I mean, that's... It's... It's got mo uh, cabinet ministers, it's got possibly the prime minister and the chancellor losing their seats. Mm. It really is devastating. The Tories. We're not, we're not heading for a hung parliament then. <laughs> <laughs> On this forecast, the Tories would become an England only party. They would be wiped out mm. in Scotland and Wales. They would lose every single one of the Red Wall seats that were gained in 2019 under. Under Labour, um, sorry, under, under Boris. Boris Johnson, and it would be the biggest ever defeat for the Conservatives, bar none, bigger than their 1906 general election defeat. So it really isn't good. And let me just be really boring for a minute. The, it's the method of polling that's interesting. This is MRP, multi level regression and post stratification, which is pretty accurate. It was pretty accurate in 2017, it was pretty accurate in 2019. I'm sure Tom is an expert on this, <laughs> but it's an accurate way of doing polling. Mm -hmm. So I think this means a bit more than just another poll. Yeah. And the, but, are I mean, you an expert in this? I'm, I'm not an expert in polling, but, personally, but MRPs are spoke because they look at it almost seat by seat. They, yeah. Rather than just taking those crude national numbers, you oh, I see. apply it to each of those constituents. She was kind of implying that Tom is boring, so he would know what yeah. Emma was no, no, talking just, about. Fill in the then. boring gaps. No, but <laughs> yeah. it, is, it is so staggering, isn't it, when you consider how quickly this decline has set in. Mm. I mean, we can all see why. I mean, some of it's quite prosaic reasons. You, how, you know, no incumbent government is going to survive double-digit inflation and... You've had all of these external shocks. You've had a pandemic, and obviously their handling of that was atrocious in many respects. But nevertheless, the fact that they've gone from talk of 10 more years in power, a brand new Tory coalition mm. of working class Northern and Midlands voters, as well as their, their traditional shies, to being completely routed is really staggering. The one thing that I'm convinced of, though, is that even if Keir Starmer wins by quite a considerable measure, it's going to be oddly soft at the same time. You look at the surveys and the focus groups, People don't really... It's not even that they're not in necessarily energised by Keir Starmer. They still don't really know who he is. So I think that'll be interesting yeah. as to how long that honeymoon period is because of the fact that they're, they're voting for change, but they're not necessarily voting for Labour and Keir Starmer, if that makes sense. Yes, or yeah. or yeah. they're staying at home, Tom, because I think, oh, think yes. it's going to be, you know, in terms of turnout, it's going to be absolutely crucial. I know so many Conservatives, ideological Conservatives, who are just thinking, what is there to vote for? They can't quite go as far as reform. Mm. And they're thinking, I'll just stay home. Mm -hmm. People the, who want to vote, people who yeah, want to vote, but absolutely. don't feel there is anything for them to vote for. On the big issues mm -hmm. that people care about, will we see anything significantly different? Because I just think no. they, they'll want to see, you know, they'll, 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 they'll need to woo over mm -hmm. the, the Tory voters or the, who've led to them their votes, if you like. Well, I um, think both parties have drifted towards the centre. That's what they do, isn't it? Well, yeah. Uh, well, although the Conservative is also being pulled to the right. So, and, and look at where reform have come in such a short time. I mean, really, up to, what, 10 12% in the polls. So, 
I, mm. No, I don't feel wildly different. I don't think they're offering anything wildly different between Sunak and Starmer, and they both feel very, very bland and mm. very, but very blank. Neither of them is exciting or inspiring that's the public. So, that's what's so depressing about it. It feels like we've gone back to the kind of factory reset mode of British politics, <laughs> where you do just have competing flavours of blancmange. And yeah. that was the one very good thing about Brexit, I think, amongst many good things about it, uh, was the fact that it forced politics to kind of respond to what people wanted. It, but it, it also created became more quite vitriolic. But sometimes mm. I think it became vitriolic because the attempt to stop it more than anything else, really. But, yeah. you, I, but at the same time, you do need politics to reflect where people are at. If you've got two parties which are basically kind of dancing on the head of a pin, I don't think that's good for democracy either. No. Should, we, should we move on to the Telegraph, Tom? This is the, uh, Rishi's Easter message where, where you've got Keir Starmer mm -hmm. looking forward, change, rebirth, regrowth, etc., etc. And Rishi is reflecting <laughs> in his Easter message. It's, it's not hard to read the kind of political <laughs> no. tones to this. As you say, you've got Labour saying maybe it's time for a renewal, it's time for change. And you've got Rishi Sunak saying it's time to pause and reflect, which I think kind of translates as please, please give us a <laughs> Give us another look. You don't even have to vote for us. Just give us, just give us another <clears> look. <throat> yes. Yeah, so this is obviously, you know, th there's all the kind of w warm words and rhetoric one would expect, talking about the importance of faith at a time like this. Talk, um, Rishi Sunak specifically talking about the contributions of Christians up and down the country, as well as the um, brutal treatment of them in certain parts around the world, which still carries on to this day. But as you say, you can't help but read the politics into this, and it does seem to reflect what we have been talking about, which is Labour riding high in the Tories desperately asking for the public to give them a second chance. Is there any we should make of it, the fact that Keir Starmer put out a video message, mm -hmm. whereas Rishi just put out basically a, a, a tweet? Yeah, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's difficult, isn't it? Because at times like this, anything which um, is, is read into so, on so many different levels, yeah. you know, what are they trying to say? Are they putting in more effort, what have you? But I dare say that the, the nation is not on tenterhooks waiting to hear what either of these two have to say over the bank holiday weekend. No, 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 we're not, are we, I think really? people are more interested in their, what's in their Easter egg. Yeah, well, sadly mm. it's the case, but I don't say that... Uh, an Easter message from two politicians in the year of a general election is never going to just be... Don't what, really look at the spiritual be. leadership. No. Or leadership at all, these. Um, Emma, uh, when Labour win, yeah. which um, <laughs> is, uh, is what the Sunday Times is saying, um, the Sunday Telegraph saying that Labour's... Uh, net zero plans will leave us at the mercy of China. Well, yeah, it's Claire Coutinho saying this, who, by the way, is a close pal or close ally of Rishi Sunak. It's convenient, okay. isn't it, that she suddenly is criticising Labour's net <clears> zero plans. <throat> so their plan is to basically make us green or to get us to... Um, to convert Britain to clean power by 2030, which is only five years ahead of the Tories' alleged plans for 2035. But anyway, she's going full on attack. She's saying that Labour's dangerous net zero plans leave us overly reliant on Beijing, Why? on their batteries, on their cables, on their wires, on their electricity, uh, sorry, Chinese made metals, all of that kind of stuff. She's saying that, you know, at a time when we're just moving away, we're trying to move away from, she's the energy security secretary, we're yeah. trying to move away from our over reliance on Russia and oil and gas and we are and Labour's plans according to Claire Coutinho are going to make us over reliant dangerously reliant on on China but and are going to uh, threaten our ability to keep the lights on I mean she goes for it but how how is there a Labour's plan apart from that they're slightly faster how are they any different? We, we, that five-year difference between yeah. the plans because, is not going to be a difference well, look, suddenly producing batteries <clears> and enabling <throat> all the rest And of neither it. of them have made any proper long-term plans. We've seen Starmer, um, you know, U-turning anyway. We haven't got long-term plans in place. You can't build nuclear power stations in five, in a year. You no. just can't. There Minimum any five years. They keep, they keep turning around. But, but they are saying that, you know, they're, they're worried about this, the plan is unfeasible, and that we will be, um, yeah, that, that, that we'll be in the hands of China. Which, you know, China is a big threat at the moment, so she you can see kind of have a point. where she's coming from, but you can see also how mm. she's trying to shift the narrative, take the attack to Labour on something that, I don't know, most people in the pubs up and down the country aren't really, you know, getting that worked up about right now. No. But a lot of people are talking about football. Mm. Tom, Absolutely. what's happening here? This is the uh, front page of The Sun on Sunday, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so there's been a sort of um, warning issued to England fans as they head over to Euro 2024 about the threat of terrorism um, and about um, concerns particularly recently given that ISIS-K attack in Moscow, where mm. all the people lost their lives, absolutely brutal. But also, in recent years, there have been increasing kind of attacks in and around football stadiums. Remember the um, Sweden-Belgian qualifier? Yes. 
not that long ago where a few Sweden fans lost their lives. Um, there was also, it's, what, it's kind of forgotten now, but during the Paris attacks in 2015, one of the uh, attacks, one of the bombings was at the Stade de France where France yeah. was playing Germany at mm. the time. So whilst up until this point we haven't seen as many kind of attacks targeting football, it's obviously always going to be a big concern given the numbers of people mm. that are turning out. Um, there's also a lot of discussion around the way in which this could be a target not just for Islamist terrorists, but also concerns about other kind of forms of extremism. Use of drones is one thing that's noted here. So, and just talking about all the measures which are being used to kind of throw a ring of steel around the It's taking part in Germany, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, and, yeah. and at various different teams, but also the fans themselves, making sure that extra level of checks and security, even instituting kind of border checks in a way you wouldn't normally see in landlocked European Germany, um, just to try and assuage it's, this concern. Is Germany on a higher terror alert than we are at the moment? That I'm not sure, but I imagine it will be kind of similar as far as they haven't been targeted themselves recently. Yeah. But there was that concern, particularly in the wake of October 7th, and there were a few foiled Islamist terrorist mm. plots, hamas linked terrorist plots, one of which in Germany itself. So I think naturally concerns will be riding very high as a consequence of that. Yeah, mm. I mean, that would, if I was going to that, it, that, it would worry me. Mm. It would. It's got to be born in mind, but do you let it scare you off? I, mean, I, I think diehard fans here. will be making their way out there, and we know that there's some, been some trouble with, you know, fans who are planning to go from here. But it's a big sporting summer, and there are going to be lots of these, you know, raised terror threat alerts when you've got, as you say, when you've got huge amounts of people gathered in one place. And they're big targets, aren't they, these events? Oh, well, yeah. And I would still go. Are. I would still go. Terror works by terrorising. You don't give in. Yeah, no, I agree. I remember in my local shopping centre, not very long ago, there was armed police all wandering about and things. Mm. And you sort of think, oh, what's going on yeah. here? Mm. Yeah. But you've just got to sort of you have get to on with it, it, don't you? Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. Oh, dear. It's, it's worrying, though. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to worry people. Mm. Um, lovely. Emma, Tom, we shall see you both yeah, a, a little bit later on. Look forward to that. But in the meantime, it's Easter, so we had a lovely day yesterday, but I don't think it's going to last, I think it? it might be raining. I think it might be. Mm. Just a tad. Here's Craig Stan. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well, today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, western England and Wales, but further east, there's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather great afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again, 14 or 15 degrees. Into the evening, we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent, and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit dry here, and in any clear skies, we will see a touch of frost. So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall, though. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. Looks like things are heating up. Box Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Now the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. They and you said pay. this, you said it again recently, you made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw 
two, three weeks ago. The question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope. I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? NATO has to treat the U.S. fairly, because if it's not for the United States, NATO literally doesn't even exist. But they took advantage of us, like most countries do. If they start to pay their bills properly, and the club is fair, are places like Poland defended? Will America be there? I believe the United States was paying 90 percent of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO. It could be 100 yep. percent. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems. It's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there? Yes, 100 percent, 100 percent. Thank you. Good morning, 7 o'clock, Sunday the 31st of March. Today, happy Easter Sunday. Leaders and religious figures celebrate across the world with the king set to join the rest of the royal family in Windsor. And as you wake up to presents from the Easter Bunny this morning, what's the best way to make sure you can eat your chocolate guilt-free? A new mega poll has revealed a dire tale for the Conservative Party as they reach a record low, with even the Prime Minister at risk of losing his seat. Happy Easter, unless you are a Conservative MP. Less than 100 of them set to be left after the election, according to this new poll. I'll bring you the details shortly. Good morning. It was a thrilling day of Premier League action, which saw 26 goals in eight games. There was criticism for Chelsea from their manager, Maurizio Pochettino, as they drew with Burnley. West Ham threw away a 3-1 lead before losing at Newcastle. And we'll be looking back on a controversial day on the Thames as Cambridge won the boat race. Good morning. The clocks have sprung forward overnight, but for some of us, especially during Easter Monday, the weather is certainly not looking very spring-like at all. Find out all the information with me in a little bit. Morning to you, I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Dawn Neeson, wishing you all a very, very happy Easter. This is Breakfast on GB News. So unprofessional. So unprofessional. Which um, bit? I will just say, coming up for you very shortly, we're talking to Catherine Forster, <laughs> who is sat here eating chocolate. <laughs> I wonder what you were and talking I, about. All I can God, hear. I thought you've got a mini egg in all my mouth. <laughs> All I can hear is you munching away on chocolate. <laughs> you have to do a professional job here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Happy Easter to you too, Happy Stephen Easter, Dixon. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we have to put up with in this place. It's just one little tiny one. Oh, I, can no. hear it. Oh, I can smell it. <laughs> oh, I can smell it. Um, look, actually, if you are having a bit of chocolate or an Easter egg hunt or whatever today, um, Jack's been in touch. Hi, Jack. Love this message. I'm a 60 year old ex gunner, he says. I've just returned from hiding four Easter eggs <clears> on <throat> Blackpool front for my granddaughter. Posted a treasure map. Oh, she's eight, and I'm pretty blessed to have three brilliant sons and an ace granddaughter. Um, it also goes on to say, I wish people would stop fighting just for one day. I've I, had to fight, and it's pretty rubbish. I love that. Jack, happy Easter to you and your family. Mm. Enjoy that. I, I, I'm Jack. Can I pop up and join in? Uh, meanwhile, Mo says, uh, um, and I love this one as well, uh, good morning to everyone of every religion. When will people realise that it does not matter what your religion is, God loves us all. So if you are of faith, whatever faith that is, um, have a blessed day. Now, people up and down the country will be celebrating Easter today. Families are either heading to church, perhaps having lunch or sitting around enjoying those chocolates. <laughs> yeah, like some people in the studio. And our politicians have also released their Easter messages with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying... For many of us in the UK, Easter is a chance to pause and reflect and an opportunity to spend some precious time with our families and a moment to enjoy the start of spring. So this weekend, let me wish you all a very happy and peaceful Easter. Well, the leader of the opposition, Sakir Starmer's Easter message is, 
interesting <laughs> because it's really quite well I mean it's not political in and of itself but you know it's very mm. thinly veiled the Easter story he says is one of hope and <clears throat> renewal overcoming adversity and light prevailing over darkness as families and friends gather to celebrate the holiday we turn our thoughts towards new beginnings our future and how things can change for the better. No, no political message there whatsoever. Um, and, of course, uh, today all eyes will be on Windsor as the King is set to join the royal family for their annual Easter service at St George's Chapel. Well, let's talk to royal biographer and photographer Ian Lloyd. Good to see you this morning, Ian. Um, it's going to be... Oh, happy Easter. Yeah, happy Easter. Easter. But it's going to be interesting. Um, it's, it's difficult. We all want to see the King... We want to, but we want to see him looking well, don't we? So it, it is going to be fascinating to get that glimpse of him today. Well, absolutely. But the fact that they issued a statement saying that he's going is a positive step because um, when the Queen was frail and the Queen Mother was frail, uh, it was usually wait and see on the day approach. Do you know what I mean? So to sort of um, just see how they would cope. The fact that a few days ago they announced he was going is to be seen as a, a positive sign, I think. Ian, you've followed the royal family for, for a long time, so you must know them fairly well. How do you think Charles will be feeling, King Charles, sorry, King Charles will be feeling if he had let people down? We all understand cancer treatment is not a good thing to go through. It's very, it's very it's exhausting, basically. But he well, would be determined to be there today, won't he? Yeah, that, that's something he's inherited from his mother. I think he knows that should he not turn up, then that would be um, a worrying sign so that... Um, uh, he, he will definitely try his best to be there. I mean, whether he'll drive down, I don't know, because they walk normally from mm. what's called the upper ward, the top bit, down to the lower ward where the chapel is. And you can see on your footage, they're going through something called the Galilee porch, which actually is a direct link to where they sit, sit which is in the choir. So he's not sitting with the congregation, so that um, that means that he's not likely uh, to be in a situation where he could possibly meet people and get a, a virus or anything like that, you know, so he will be separated. And then afterwards, uh, they normally go to a reception, but whether or not he'll bother with that with the dean afterwards is is doubtful, I would think. But uh, they normally have a reception and they go back for their, uh, their kind of lamb lunch like the rest of us, you know. Mm, well, they might be heading straight back to bed to, to rest up. To rest, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's good that, that he's getting out and about, that we will see it, but we've... I mean, in one sense, he, he, he must be benefiting from the fact he knows this is, there is a, a huge outpouring of support for him. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, um, people have been writing and getting letters back and so on. And it, it does, you know, it means a lot, doesn't it, when you, you're not very well and, and people are thinking about you. Um, but uh, he obviously must be worried about Catherine mm. as well, um, and it's it's come at a bad time. The other thing is that as head of state, he's he he needs to be at certain things, so they'll they they'll, they'll be concerned about that. I mean, there's upcoming Commonwealth visits to uh, uh, Australia certainly later in the year, and um, it's the D-Day commemorations in June, isn't it? Uh, what's that? Eighty years since uh, 1944. So. He'll want to try and be well for, for that. But the great thing is that um, we saw with the Queen, the late Queen, is that um, you can do a lot of things remote, can't you? Mm. And he did last week. He couldn't get to the Maundy service, so he mm. did a, um, a, a sort of broadcast. So you can do a lot of that kind of thing today, which, uh, which they couldn't years ago. So, uh, so that's a good thing. And do you think that he will be more determined to be there because of Catherine's situation. It, you know, it's very important for us to see him there and sort of like, you know, while Catherine is indeed having treatment herself. Yeah, I mean, there's a problem, isn't there, with the royal family? They're quite depleted. I mean, mm. um, there's, they're just, um, you can't call it natural wastage, but people getting older, like the cousins and so on, and, and, and not working in the way that, that they could uh, many years ago. So um, there's only four of them under... 70, that's Catherine, William and Edward and his wife, Sophie. So um, the rest are, are, are elderly. So he's got to be, um, I think, seen, like you say, to, to um, be looking as well as he can. And also not just Catherine, it's his wife, you know, the, the Queen, who um, uh, we saw last week in Shrewsbury and in, in Worcester for the Maundy. I mean, she's um, she wasn't born royal and she didn't mm. sort of carry out engagements till she was in her 50s. So it's... Um, um, you know, a bit of a strain on her as well. So I suppose he'd be concerned, probably, you know, the whole family. But, but yeah, you know, he's, he's the head of state, so he wants to be seen to be, um, you know, doing really well.
Yeah. Well, fingers crossed for him yeah. today. Yeah. Hope he's having a nice lie-in before he <laughs> has to get ready for the day ahead. Uh, Ian, good to see you. Thank As always, you. thanks very much indeed. And staying with the Easter message, in today's ever-increasing secular society, churches are finding it harder than ever to have their messages heard and congregations are shrinking. So it begs the question, what role should churches play in a modern society? Our Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beattie has been to an outreach ministry in Belfast that deals with addiction and homelessness. We go out and, and reach people in society who are broken. Uh, many of them living on the streets. And when, when they live on the streets, 99% of them then get addicted to drugs uh, in some way. We bring them in and we offer them hope. Uh, the hope is found in Jesus Christ. Teen Challenge can't change anyone, but Jesus Christ can. Uh, and we, we make that plain to, to, to the folk. Uh, that there is a way out of addiction and there is a way out of the darkness and there is a way out of the pain and that there is hope. Our motto is putting hope within the reach of every addict and the hope, which is the name of this building, the hope is Jesus. Pastor Brian Madden leads Teen Challenge in Belfast and points to the need for a sense of belonging and belief. Everyone that comes in here belongs. They don't necessarily go to church, but they love coming here. They love coming to a Christian organization. They, they never, ever, ever refuse prayer. I just prayed with a young man there five minutes ago. I think it's the first time anyone has prayed for him in his life. When churches such as this one were first built, they were so much more than a place to worship. They projected power and social standing. They were a communication hub for the community. But do they still have the same relevance today? Buildings are, for their very nature, they're buildings that at one time could have fulfilled a, a very important function, and maybe they don't now. So if you think back to the earlier centuries, walking into a, a church building could have been a warm and comfortable space, a place where there was a sense of community, where they didn't have other grand buildings. Imagine walking into a cathedral and the high ceilings, the stained glass windows. The grandeur of it all just spoke of the majesty of God. Many churches are funding the Hope Project, and evangelist Keith Mitchell says churches may change, but their message must remain. So a core principle shouldn't change, and our method should always be one in terms of what is the culture saying around us, and how do we engage in that culture? In a way that we are, we are living out love and grace, but also we're embracing truth. We're not compromising on truth. And I think the church has a radical message of hope to still bring to the world today. And we do that in lots of different ways. So you might be looking at an old building now and say, you know, how is this relevant? But it's from the cafe at the side. And when people come in here on a a Thursday night to worship, they see something contemporary, they see something new, they see something fresh. And in the world today, people need hope, and the church champions hope more than any other religious organization in the world. Doogie BD, GB News, Belfast. Well, in his Easter message, the Prime Minister has welcomed the opportunity to have a chance to pause and reflect, as he, of course, is gearing up for that general election at mm. some point. <laughs> Quite a bit of reflection needed then. Uh, but a new mega poll in the Times newspaper has revealed the Conservatives are on track for the worst election results ever. Yes. Uh, and, and, I mean, this is just shocking. No matter who you support, this is pretty shocking either which way. The poll found Tor the Tories could win fewer than 100 seats, Labour getting a majority of 286. I mean, it's absolutely that's unheard it. of. That's literally... Uh, well, talking us through this one is political correspondent Catherine Forster, who joins us this morning. Catherine, this is a shocking poll. It's absolutely horrendous. And Rishi Sunak talking about reflection. Um, I imagine all Conservative MPs will be reading this on the front page of the Sunday mm. Times and reflecting. And we know a few letters of no confidence have gone in. Uh, it's possible that after the May election, there might be a challenge to Rishi Sunak's leadership. But basically, there seems to be no way out because as things stand, the Conservatives are set to be... Uh, 
wiped out completely in Scotland and Wales, only having seats in England. 98 of them. Uh, Rishi Sunak, his lead only about 2%, so within the margin of error, according to this MRP poll of 15,000 uh, people, which is done in a, in a very systematic way, which means that they tend to be reasonably accurate. Of course, things mm -hmm. can always change. Yeah. Um, but a lot of Conservative big beasts, cabinet ministers set to lose their seats too, including favourites for the leadership potentially after the next election, assuming they lose. Penny Mordaunt, James Cleverley, Grant Shapps, all forecast to be gone. Uh, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, possibly might cling on by 1%, possibly not. So it is beyond horrendous for the Conservative Party. And of course, what this is doing is bringing out critics of Rishi Sunak, like Lord Frost, saying it's a desperate situation. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Um, and his uh, remedy is, he says, current policies have uh, alienated huge numbers of our voters. So plenty of people within the Conservative Party thinking we need to go more to the right. Of course, all this very public infighting within the Conservative Party is not helping. People do not elect mm. divided parties. Lots of people within the Conservatives think, oh, if only we did this, if only we did that, if only we did the other. But are they really going to get rid of another leader? <laughs> and if there is a leadership challenge, which could happen by accident, and Rishi Sunak tried to go to the country, Surely that would be even worse. So they are in a whole world of pain. And frankly, there doesn't seem to be any uh, way out for them at the moment. Now, Rishi Sunak, of course, will hope the economy will continue to turn around. People will start to feel better off. But That's really, at the moment, an... that... no. It's no. very difficult to see how even that could be enough. It, it's very difficult. And of course, you can say, Look at previous elections. In 2015, they expected a hung parliament. The Conservatives got a majority. In 2017, Theresa May went to the polls because she was riding high. Majority. She was going to smash it. And look, she lost her majority. Things can change very fast. But after 14 years and them circling through so many leaders very r recently and the state of public services, high taxes, etc., it's exceedingly difficult to see how they could turn this around. I have to say, I find it very... Although, of course, I'm not a politician, and they, they view the world through a very different sort of lens when it comes to this sort of thing. But I look at these things and just say, why don't they just get on with it? Because if the, it looks like there's, there's no way out mm. of this, so why not just crack on and see what the country wants? Well, because the Conservative Party is a coalition of lots of factions and they've all got different answers and approaches. And unfortunately for Rishi Sunak, because he, many of them will say, doesn't have a mandate, he wasn't elected by uh, the voters, he wasn't elected even by Conservative Party members like Liz Truss, although bear in mind that was like 0.01% mm. of the population. And so they feel free to wade in and say, well, you're not doing this enough or you're not doing that enough. And, and, and that in itself is unhelpful because they're very publicly looking divided. And, you know, Keir Starmer, for all the divisions bubbling under the surface uh, within, uh, you know, about Gaza, etc., on the face of it, the Labour Party appears much more uh, united at the moment than the Conservatives. Yeah. Okay, Gosh, Catherine. Thing, thank, thank you very you. much indeed. It's well, it's it's I suppose it's easier to be, it's easier to be united in opposition when you think you've got of a chance course. to of win. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah. And and when you think you're going to win, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, heck, you just, I, I just don't know why they don't just call it. Be I, I know they're guaranteed. I know they'd be sort of if they called it for six weeks from now, they'd be guaranteed to Well, lose. because it's going to happen in any case, isn't it? But do you think they just don't want to... Th it's quite difficult to throw in the towel. But I sort of think the longer they limp on, the more desperate it looks. Maybe they, maybe they are hopeful. Maybe, maybe they think there is something that's going to magically come along and change things. I can't see it. Easter really. Bunny? I mean, I know they'll be hoping, hoping and praying for 1992 all over again, where obviously Labour yes, was expected to get in, yeah. and then they didn't. Um, 
But I, I, I don't know. I just sort of, I think people are fed up with it now. Oh, well, let, let me know. GBviews at gbnews.com. Would you just like to get on with it now? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. No, I think it's I think it's lots of people out there, and I think it, it, we have very low turnout. Mm. I think you know, people are just going. I don't know who to vote for. They're all the same. They're all as bad as each other. Actually, that's a fa that is a really interesting point because I've talked to a lot of people recently who traditionally have supported all sorts of yeah. parties, who all say, "I really don't know who to no. vote for," and they're going from L Labour to Conservative to Reform. I mean, it's quite a, it's quite a political difference between yeah. all three. And they're still saying, I don't know which of those three to vote for. Yeah, and you know, it's, nobody's even mentioned the Lib Dems anymore. No. Whether they'll do well... Or the might. Green Party. Well, of course, Caroline Lucas is... I know she's not technically the leader of the Green Party anymore, but she's stepping down at the next yeah. election, so that's their only MP. Whether they'll get any more or not, I don't know. Oh, dear um, lordy. I know. Happy Easter. No, it's interesting, though. Yeah, it is interesting. It is interesting. I just want to crack on with it. I don't want to be talking. I don't want it to be interesting for another seven months. No, that's true. Because everything now is white noise. I'm not believing a word any of them are saying. It's like all oh, the everything they say, no matter how they dress it up, is just like, vote for me. Yeah, basically. Uh, right, 19 minutes past seven. Other stories for you this morning. And churches are being warned by the Home Secretary not to allow asylum seekers to exploit the system by apparently converting to Christianity. James Cleverly says there's a real difference between welcoming a new member of the congregation or vouching for a person in an asylum tribunal. Mm. Meanwhile, the Metropolitan Police have arrested four people sus suspected of planning to disrupt the annual Oxford-Cambridge boat race on the River Thames. The fool says it was made aware protesters were planning disruption, but officers were able to take swift action to intercept the plans. The Cambridge rowing team claimed double victory with the men and women's teams winning the historic race. But the rowers warned not to jump in the water because of the high levels of E-coli. New video has been released in the stage showing the inside of the container ship that hit, hit the Baltimore Bridge, causing it to collapse. The footage has been released by the National Transport Safety Board. It's one of the first glimpses inside the vessel that collided with the bridge on Tuesday. That's amazing, that footage in that boat. I still can't get... Just, the way that bridge collapsed was just... Well, the way the bridge went. Oh, my it's God. Terrible. What do you want to drink? Let me do it. Because nobody's bought you anything. What do you want to drink? Still on air, though. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine Forster, our political reporter, who is also a very, very good hostess, um, and is... <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to drink? Well, I'll have a, I'll have a, a, a black coffee with a splash of milk out of the fridge. Hey, Catherine, I'll, Catherine, I'll have a normal gin and tonics, love, if you're OK. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you see, this is what a lack of sleep does to you when the clock's change. <laughs> Still on the Four, time, it's a lack of sleep and it's too much chocolate. <laughs> we've gone to the weather. <laughs> <laughs> no, Let's hope very everyone's kind. having a lion. Let's hope everyone's having a that's lion. That's very kind, though. That's the end of your Christmas party blooper tape sorted in one fist. <laughs> Love it. Love it. If she's not stuffing her face, she's making coffee. Oh, right. she's brilliant. I love uh, coffee. All right, let's have a look at the weather. Here's Craig. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well, today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, western England and Wales, but further east, there's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather great afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland Scotland and Northern Ireland, but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again, 14 or 15 degrees. Into the evening, we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent, and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit drier here, and in any clear skies, we will see a touch of frost.
So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall, though, but all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. So Catherine has actually gone and put the kettle on there. <laughs> She's out there. I love. Um, I love it when stuff like that. She's, oh, it's brilliant. This is what it's about. This is real, isn't it? I yeah, mean, you know, it's Easter chat. Sunday. Sunday it's morning. Real. So she's. But she's. I promise you, she's eaten so much chocolate this morning. I don't know what. Her kids she's are probably saying. hyper. So it's a combination of lack of sleep and hyper. That's a dangerous combination. It is. Isn't it? Anyway, yeah. it's the one day of the year when you can have chocolate for breakfast. Just not too is much. It? <laughs> well, we're going we're to be finding out if that's really true. Uh, we're speaking to a nutritionist in a couple of minutes. <laughs> I'm Tom Harwood. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tominey, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tominey Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Camilla Tominey. This is GB News, Britain's election channel. Sorry. Uh, we're still waiting for our cups of tea, by the way, if anyone there... Um, is want... wondering. Yeah, is wondering. Uh, any case, uh, to go with the chocolate, obviously, because today is one of the few days of the year, which is not true in my world, actually, where you can overindulge on chocolates and sweets without feeling too guilty. Yeah, we always feel a bit guilty, though, don't we? Mm. Well, when you reach a certain age, at least. When you're <laughs> a kid, it doesn't matter. Um, many of us, of course, uh, 
waking up to chocolate eggs for breakfast. Um, I, we never did that as kids. We never... We weren't allowed. No, we didn't. We had to wait, especially yeah, we, we weren't to allowed wait. to eat them for breakfast. No. Anyway, uh, we may be thinking, is it OK to do so? Um, well, what's the right amount of chocolate to eat? And is it... <laughs> who knows? None, stop, probably. Stop when you feel sick. Um, and is it... <laughs> 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 Nutritional advice there, uh, not. Um, any case, someone that does know what they're talking about with how much chocolate you can eat um, is nutritionist Rhiannon Lambert. Uh, Rhiannon, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Have you ever said stop eating chocolate <laughs> when it makes you feel sick? <laughs> morning. It's an interesting one, isn't it? I don't think I actually personally had chocolate eggs for breakfast either growing up. But um, what I will say is it, it's up to each household, isn't it? It's up to the parents who decide what their children do every day. And equally, how much, for instance, I think a lot of people a decade or two ago would have grown up with perhaps one or two chocolate eggs, whereas today I think there is definitely a rise in um, more quantity doing so. But let's be honest, if there's one day of the year that I think that chocolate for breakfast and who, who put a rule on it really and said it, I guess you can't have it at breakfast, is OK. It's going to be on Easter Sunday. It's a one off. It most definitely, I hope, doesn't happen every single day. That's the thing, though, isn't it? Because we had all the Dr Kelso from the NHS mm. saying, uh, you know, don't eat a whole egg at once and all this sort of ridiculous things, actually, um, when, you, when you look at it. But it's all about this being a one-off day or perhaps a one-off weekend. Um, that's the difference, isn't it? It's if you're eating the bad stuff on a regular basis that you've got a problem. Yeah, absolutely. And we've got to remember that I don't think anybody will feel fantastic after eating a whole chocolate egg anyway. Um, I think most people have a cutoff limit to when they'll start to feel a little bit nauseous or they get that instant blood sugar drop after they've had the high from the fast releasing um, sugar that's entered their bloodstream. But in all honesty, perhaps having it for breakfast might might be a better idea for some because they then go on to eat their normal lunch and dinner and end their day without a sugar rush. Um, but for some, it might continue all day long and I'm not demonising that either. Just try and get back to normal um, the day after and enjoy everything in moderation. I agree. A whole egg probably as a portion is not a great idea. Maybe stagger it a little bit if you can, just purely to enjoy it as well. I think you'll enjoy it more if you savour it. Uh, can, uh, um, I'm sorry, I think anyone that puts chocolate back in the fridge is basically a psychopath. Um, <laughs> you have to eat it all in one go. Sorry, just me. Um, but it, the one thing I want to stop people doing is feeling guilty about this. We always say, that's bad food, that's good food. As you said, Rihanna, just now, everything in moderation is fine. Moderation, Dawn, remember. Um, but how do you stop yourself feeling guilty? So the psychology and food work hand in hand. That's something I do all the time in my nutrition clinic is have a think about how you view the world of food and the food rules you put on yourself. And actually an exercise I do use for some clients sometimes who feel that they want to go cold turkey on an item to stop them doing that because I think that does instill a bad relationship mm. with food. It's impossible for anyone to say I'm never, ever, ever going to eat chocolate again if they love chocolate. I just think that instills an unhealthy relationship with food. You're much better off almost trying to have it for breakfast, for instance, seeing how you feel, getting it out of your system. I'm not saying this is an overnight change. Psychology is deeply rooted and it can take a long time if you turn to food as a coping mechanism. But if you introduce that sugar in the morning and realise it doesn't make you feel your best, but hey, you had a bit and you know it's not out of bounds, you're less likely to overeat. There is research that suggests if you allow yourself enjoyed items, you are less likely to binge and develop that unhealthy mm. relationship oh. with food. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, good it's a good lesson. Rhiannon, great you. to talk to you this morning. Thanks very much indeed. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. She's, she, she's she, off now to have an egg. She, no, she looks like... In the mood. She is very gorgeous. She looks very fit. She looks like she's off to have an Easter carrot or something or other. No, I don't... Um, do you know what? You've got to... Uh, I said, if, if you're talking to a nutritionist, you need them to look healthy. That's true, actually. That's true. Otherwise, yeah, that it'd be is true. To worry, there'd Otherwise, be something yeah. to worry about, yeah. wouldn't there? But you've got to... I think that's absolutely right when not saying, don't cut it all out, don't say you can't have any of that. You that just, is dangerous relationship it. with anything, isn't it? It's like, right, I'm never eating chocolate again. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not healthy. A little bit of what you fancy does you good, doesn't it, Stephen? Oh, it does. That certainly does. Uh, I fancy a little bit of sport in a couple of minutes. Aidan, what have you got for us? Well, we'll be hearing how Chelsea surrendered not one... 
One lead, but two leads against Burnley, against 10-man Burnley. In fact, it was two leads, in fact. You messed up my line now. Goodness <laughs> me. Never mind. Anyway, we'll be hearing about how Cambridge overcame Oxford, not once, but twice as well, on a tumultuous day on the Thames. See you after the break. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here, or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're gonna be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Aidan McGee's here. Oh, God. Oh, oh <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Oh, Thank heavens we're on a break there. <laughs> Hope our mics are down. <laughs> Aidan's got the sport for us this morning. Should we talk? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. West la, la. Ham. La, la. Oh, oh, what an awful, me. awful time they've had. I used to write the ratings for The Sun about 20 years ago and used to have to write about half a sentence or maybe mm -hmm. half a paragraph for each player and give them a mark out of ten. Yep. If I was assessing Calvin Phillips yesterday, and this guy has had a, not a one, not an Anas Horribilis, probably about a, a, whatever a double Anas Horribilis is, because ever since Euro 2020, which was played in 2021, his career has really gone off the rails. I mean, he went to um, Leeds United, didn't work out for him, being injured all the time, went to West Ham, didn't perform, lost his place in England squad to Kobe Mainu, looks like, even though Gareth Southgate has given him every time, mm. every chance to get into England squad, it's not worked out this, this move to West Ham. So he comes on yesterday, as you know, Dawn, with 21 minutes to go. West Ham are leading 3 1 at Newcastle mm. United. And then he gives away a penalty straight away. It turns the game. When you've got a packed house there, Stephen, you give, you give anyone an inch, they take a mile, right? Mm. Newcastle got it back to 2 2. They scored three goals in 14 minutes. It was a massive VAR delay. Everything went against the Hammers. And 
Newcastle ended up edging a seven-goal thriller. And David Moyes was asked afterwards, you know, what did you think of that substitution? Because as far as inspirational changes goes, he wasn't exactly up there. And he said, and the back page of the Mail on Sunday, Calvin did not work, admits Moyes. And in brackets, you can say that again. It was absolutely awful. Yeah. I remember there was a player called Zat Knight of Fulham. He gave away a penalty. He, what else did he do? He scored an own goal and he got sent off all in the first 15 minutes of a game I attended in 2004. I gave him three out of ten and wrote, it is difficult to imagine a worse performance than this. That might be... We rose to the yesterday. challenge there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Aidan. So, yeah, thrilling game, but, but a thrilling game nonetheless. Seven, seven goals uh, there. Yeah. And we need to look as well at Chelsea because the, the, the back page of the Mail on Sunday, bottle jobs, is the, the line there. Now, Pochettino, the manager at Chelsea, made this... Quite outlandish claim in the week. He said that based on the statistics, his own dubious statistical analysis, Chelsea, who are currently 11th in the table, should be in the top four. Now, yes, based on chances created, they probably should be, but that's an attack on his strikers because clearly they're not putting the ball in the net. Yeah. And that's what you have to do. That's the aim of the game, right? So they're now in, in 11th place where they roughly hovered all season. They spent a billion pounds in the last 15 months or so. And they failed to dispatch Burnley, who were right at the bottom of the league. They had 10 men yesterday. They took the lead twice. And Pochettino said in his press conference, it wasn't as so much what he said, but he said sometimes it's more about this than it is about this, talking about the, yeah. the heart and the legs. And that, for me, we talked about mentality, we talked about determination, we talked about psychology earlier on. For Manchester United, you can probably read Chelsea right now. All yeah, right. Is Pochettino... Is he on his way out, then? Um, no, look, I th I, I, I've never known a manager go into a club and engender so much good feeling. So he's, 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 some, some would say he's getting a real extended honeymoon period. There are, the problem <coughs> with Chelsea is every three or four games you might see hope or, or glimmers that they might, they might be in, undergoing a resurgence. Finally, they're looking like Pochettino's side. But when they can't dispatch Burnley at home yesterday, and we're nine games to go now, Steve, and they're leaving it very late to do anything, they got to the, cap to the uh, Capital One Cup final, of course, but beyond there... It's, it's been another dismal season for them, really, I would argue. And I wouldn't be surprised if he wasn't there beyond this summer. Oh, Chelsea was the only thing that cheered me up yesterday, frankly, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. Oh, dear. Well, well I mean, it's sad, I know. Um, we've got uh, Liverpool today yes. uh, facing Luton. Um, is, is, is this in a... Do you think this Brighton. is... A, oh, sorry, Brighton. That's, is, that's is it, wrong on that. I don't know why. That's, that's not your fault. Luton, no. no. Um, this would be the note you wrote, Dan. Is it, no, no, it wasn't me. It wasn't oh. me. No, I won't, I won't name him. I'm trying to pretend I know what I'm talking about, not just reading notes. <laughs> is this a really pivotal day? In the yeah, well it, well, it is, because, uh, you know, everyone, all eyes are on Man City and Arsenal, of course, for obvious reasons. We, we discussed that last hour, didn't we? But Liverpool faced Brighton at 2 o'clock today. And so that means they kick off two and a half hours before. They have to win that game to put daylight between themselves and the other two teams, because it's a three-way three -way title race. They know today that someone has to drop points. Someone is going to drop at least two points today. And it was, yeah, and well, in fact, two, two teams could drop two points, and that would leave them in a really great position. Not unassailable, there's plenty of football still to play, but yeah, I, I think it's a huge game. But I think they'll win. Brighton don't have a great deal of form at the moment, they they've been suffering from the European con fixture congestion. I predicted it would happen at the start of the year. That's what happens when a new club gets into Europe, they've not really juggled with those extra fixtures, and the squad struggles to get through it sometimes. And so, I think this is a huge opportunity for them. And you know what? If, they're, if, they, if they get to seven o'clock tonight and they're two, three points ahead, Goodness me, that's, um, that's a hell of a Philip going into the rest of the season. Oh, just a quickie, Aidan. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, no, just a quickie. The <laughs> clock's going forward, by yeah. the way. They have gone forward overnight, just in case you missed that one. Will it affect the players today? No, it won't, because it, it would, there was a time when it might have done, uh -huh. but now everything is done to the nth degree in terms of right. sports science. They know they, this, isn't, this isn't a surprise. This is not something that's come over no. the hill at the moment. Expectedly, they know it's going to happen, and they will have their, their rest adapted. The sleep expert I spoke about last hour, one, last hour, one of his jobs was for one football club was to go into their hotel the night before and set up all their sleeping arrangements in their hotels, and they would carry... If he did, wasn't satisfied with the sleeping arrangements at the hotel they were staying in three days before when he did a recce, he would advise them to bring their own sleep kit, which was provided by this gentleman. And so this, this is before home games, not just away games. Wow. So that's, that's the kind of detail. And that, that was 10 years ago. Ooh, I'd like a sleep You could have done kit. with that last night, couldn't you, love? Um, Aidan, thanks very much. Thank you. See you later on. Right, uh, still to come, we are going through the stories, making the news with Emma Wolfe and Tom Slater. That is indeed next. This is Breakfast. Here's Stephen Lamdorn. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. 
so many of you have been getting in touch over the waspy issue. And actually, I just want to bring forward a view from Tony, uh, who has written in to say uh, something that we haven't included in this conversation well, so then. far. Tony says, it was well publicised, stop all the crying, his words. He says the Pensions <laughs> Act 1995 provided for this change. It was marginally sped up in 2010, but the fundamental issue, the WASPy issue, didn't come about in 2010 or 2011. It came about in 1995. Yeah, people, people know that the, the legislation was earlier, but the problem was is a lot of women weren't told. Beverly, who's a WASPy woman, has written in saying, were the WASPy women living under a stone? I am one of the women who was affected by this change. My peers and I were fully aware of the changes. It was widely discussed on TV, radio and in newspapers as soon as the decision was made. We weren't happy at the time, but we recognised that it was fair. So it's wrong to spend billions in this way. I'd rather the post office people who suffered so much were reimbursed. Well, I think for the social contract to work mm. and for our society to be cohesive and harmonious, if that's possible, <laughs> you can't just have for people who, 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 who don't work or don't, or don't have much, have all the, receive all the, all the benefit. Well, now you're arguing against people. You're saying that people should have, in, to some extent, have looked in 1995 when the change happened. But, but fundamentally, it's not just it's not just WASPy women who've been screwed over since the financial crisis. We have a 70-year high tax burden. Someone earning uh, 60,000 pounds this year will pay more tax than someone earning 60,000 pounds has ever spent uh, has ever had to pay before. Yeah, Tom, Tom, you These do realise this isn't the first time that we've well. had hugely high uh, tax rates on income. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Seven forty-five. Let's have a look at the papers this morning with the journalist Emma Wolf and the editor of Spike, Tom Slater. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, something not very jolly on the front of the Sunday Times, mm. Emma. Mm. Half a million children. Um, on antidepressants. Yeah, really worrying story. I mean, we know that mental health amongst the young has been, you know, a, a bit of a, a bit of a crisis for a while. We know that, you know, we talk a lot about teenagers and sort of young people, especially the 18 to 24 group who are often not working, not in employment, not in educational training, and them sort of languishing. But now it seems that children as well are actually being put on antidepressants for things like loneliness and anxiety and depression. Um, it's not recommended for people under the age of 18 to, to be prescribed antidepressants. The problem is, of course, we don't have enough therapy, we don't have enough mm. behavioural therapists, we don't have enough... <clears throat> these very, very long waiting lists. So when you have children presenting with problems, many doctors are feeling that they have pretty much nothing they can do except putting children on antidepressants, which is not advised at all, and they should be monitored, um, or just leaving them, you know, without mm. any support. So it's not the right option, it when really you, isn't. When you say children, what age are we talking? Well, so, uh, last year there were over 4,000 um, under 10s... Who under 10? ..antidepressants, mm. which is extremely dangerous. At that age, your brain is still forming. You shouldn't be doing anything to oh kind God. of adjust your, you know, your brain chemistry in any way. There are really dangerous side effects for, uh, with antidepressants for any of us, but especially for children, uh, self-harm, suicide, all of those kinds of things. And what they really need is, you know, how, why are you feeling this way? Why are you feeling sad? Why are you feeling lonely? And there are lots of reasons. Let's talk about the pandemic yeah. for one minute. The fact is, children were not in education mm. for a couple of years. Yeah. They were not with their friends. These are things that children need. They need to be in education. They yeah. need to be at school. They need to be with their pals. They don't need to be at home on their own. No. They don't need to be, in my view, homeschooled. And they don't need to be staring at screens and phones and all of that. I think the internet 
and the whole social media world has done a huge amount of damage to our young people. Oh, totally agree. Oh, my God, that's totally awful. Totally agree. It feels like Tom. a sort of perfect storm as well, doesn't it? Because on the one hand, <clears throat> you do have this over-prescribing, which has been an open secret for a long time, not just for young people, but also people coming forward with mm. mental health concerns. It's a lot easier to, to pull out the prescription pad than it is to try and arrange in the NHS for some kind of actual therapy. Um, there's also the problem, I think, which is that with the younger generation, not only have they been hit by the pandemic and all these other issues, but also I think there's a tendency to kind of over-medicalise them as well. So the kind of general ups and downs of life, they're encouraged to think about them in terms of maybe I've got depression, maybe I've got an anxiety issue. Mm. They go to the doctor with those kinds of concerns in mind. And so rather than, again, talking about understanding it as the kind of struggles that children might experience, it becomes medicalised, You put a, people want to put a label on it. <clears throat> you throw all this together and it's really toxic. And we saw just a few days ago the rise in ADHD diagnoses, you mm. know, the putting a label on a child who is... Absolutely. I mean, my three-year-old, yes, he's hyperactive, yes, he's attention deficit, because he's a three-year-old. It's true. <laughs> but putting a yeah. label on ADHD, mm. and when we were little... And I'm not saying, of course, there are children with serious, with serious issues, yeah. with serious behavioural issues, but also, I mean, as a teenager, I spent most of my teenage years being up and down and miserable and happy and mm. it is part of life absolutely what you yeah. say you need to build resilience and I was also talking to a GP friend of mine this morning very early this morning who said they don't work antidepressants for the majority mm. of people it's not what you need I... what you need is to talk about why you're sad yeah. why you're struggling what's happening yeah. in your life but for the majority of people it's not a brain uh, it's not a chemical imbalance yeah you know so it isn't great to put well it's very very um, unfortunate to put children on this at such an early age yeah. Tom, Tom should we move on to yet another subject that's making politicians mm. um, unhappy this is labor union are complaining to Keir Starmer about Labour's use of the union flag. Yes, so another huh? Labour patriotism row. So apparently a number of MPs have been grumbling about the fact that a lot of the election leaflets will have the union flag on them, as one would the expect. The flag of a country. Exactly, okay. the nation in which they're <laughs> standing. And their claim for this is that it puts off ethnic minority voters. I find this so bizarre. First of all, it's one of those situations where you're so woke, you end up being a bit racist. Are you implying that these voters aren't British by dint of wow. being from an ethnic minority and therefore they'll be upset by it? Uh, it's also just factually inaccurate. Whenever you survey ethnic minorities and Brits in general, ethnic minority Brits tend to be slightly, mildly more patriotic and have a firmer sense mm -hmm. of their British identity than the white British public, funnily enough. And you can kind of understand why. Oftentimes, even if they were born and raised in this country, their parents might have made an active decision to join this mm. nation. There are certain yeah. reasons for that. So I find this never-ending discussion about we can't be too patriotic because it will put off ethnic minorities. It's just completely detached from reality. And, you know, I'm not... There is a certain point in which Keir Starmer and his flag waving was getting a bit ridiculous at certain points. He was never pictured without one. And that <laughs> sometimes there is an element of it just looking like you're overcompensating. I think people mm. can be patriotic without just being symbolic and flag waving and so on. But the reasons that are being cited for why they're so uncomfortable with this, I think, just don't hold any water and are quite patronising, if anything. Uh, yeah, I'm quite fed yes. up of being told that, that either the, the British flag or the English flag are, or are, are bad, racist... And racist. racist. I, I'm fed up of being apologetic. I mean, of, you know, or, or that somehow in a, the fact that we're a Christian country is wrong. We've just seen councils, Westminster Council, among others, celebrating Ramadan and not celebrating Easter. Well, what was all that about? You know, they didn't put up an Easter egg display until they... Were until someone alerted them to this fact and they had to run around Westminster trying to buy chocolate eggs or whatever. <laughs> but actually, we don't need to be apologetic about the fact that, A, we're a Christian country. It doesn't mean that we don't welcome people of all faiths and none. And, mm. you know, and, and yes, yeah. we do have a flag. We have a national flag and it's the Union Jack. Yeah. Can yeah. we talk about chocolate again, please? Yeah, Dad? we can. Thank you. <laughs> OK, it's at least You've 10 minutes since stories. I have my last mini egg. Yeah. The chocolate <laughs> section of them. Go on, go on, Tom. You go, your, your chocolate story first. This is a depressing chocolate story. Oh. Uh, but this is about why we're shelling out more for Easter eggs this year because there's been this 12.6% increase in the cost of chocolate prices coming down to the cost of cocoa, um, particularly in the kind of African nations where the vast majority of it is grown. It's been hit by droughts and so on, which has sent it shooting up. Um, also, Witch magazine have done some investigation into this, finding so some products are even 50% more expensive than they were last year, and some of them are shrinking yeah. at the same time. Yes. This phenomenon oh. of shrinkflation. Mm. <laughs> so um, whilst you're tucking into your Easter eggs this breakfast... Um, <laughs> with your gin and tonic 
next year. <laughs> uh, as Dawn likes to do, apparently. Um, that you might be noticing it's a fair bit more expensive than last year, as everything yeah. is, unfortunately. Well, well, as everything is. Yeah. Mind you, it's all right for those people with lots of money, celebs and the like. Yeah, this is just a silly, chocolatey celeb story, which I hope you'll indulge me in. Um, this is Jennifer Lopez, Kylie Minogue, Alex Jones, Holly Willoughby, all talking about their love of chocolate. Holly Willoughby says, I love anything chocolatey. She's a chocoholic. Lorraine Kelly says, her favourite indulgence... What do you think of this? Her favourite indulgence is a Terry's chocolate orange. Oh, I love a chocolate orange. I feel it's a bit a of a throwback, one? but then again... Oh. Oh, yes. yeah, a whole one. Oh, she says, could. I can happily get through an entire one in a matter of minutes. Oh, what? yeah, That's not hard. It doesn't take long Once to Once you get started orange. on a chocolate orange. Oh, I feel I like couldn't. they're a bit passe, but they are quite good. It's the one thing I asked for for Christmas Is when I was a little boy. Yeah. yeah. You sit on Santa's knee, and what would you like for Christmas? And I said... A chocolate orange. orange. But did you ever master the... the you know the, the tap? Yeah. And they're meant to open? Yeah. yeah. That never, never happens. Worked. Never, never happens. It does. It does. No just way. Gotta, like, I get, uh, every Christmas I get a chocolate orange. Really? Right? You just have to... You've got to give it a hard No, I whack. find you wrench them apart, you get one bit stuck... Yeah, yeah, and, and they're broken. Oh, no, 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 I mean, no. I used to tuck them with hammers. <laughs> Bring some in and I will oh, demonstrate really? for you. <laughs> I bet you will, <laughs> yeah. Very skilled at chocolate orange tapping. <laughs> and also Jennifer Lopez says, who has an amazing body, says, I need chocolate. Also, it's very good for you. I could eat chocolate like there's no tomorrow. There we I go. I don't yeah. believe them. No, I don't. I and don't that's the thing I with these. Sniff a chocolate. <laughs> a mm. tiny bit or a square of dark chocolate before oh, bed. Oh, they always yeah. say that, don't they? Yeah. And yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. Anyone... Start on the dark chocolate. That's it. The <laughs> bar's any... gone. Has anyone just had a square of chocolate and gone? Ever. Mm, that was delicious. And how can you that. sleep when you know the chocolate's still in the cupboard? You can't. I mean, no. calling to you. <laughs> Look, um, my, my, my theory is with biscuits and chocolate, if there's any left, it gets lonely. Yeah, it does. It needs to join the rest of it in your tummy. Absolutely. It better not be in that cupboard, because you don't want a naughty cupboard. It's better to finish no, it no, off no, and no, start no. again tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I think, that's a, I think that's a very, very valid point. And Alison Hammond says, chocolate is like my crack cocaine. She says, I get a physical reaction and I just feel happy and then I want another. At least well, I believe Alison actually I eats believe chocolate, Alison. unlike yeah. some of these skinny A-listers. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, I, well, yeah. Not that we're skinny shaming anyone. No, 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 no. no. Don't do it, Dawn. Yes, no. I did, sorry. No, we don't fat shame anyone, so we don't skinny shame anyone. <laughs> no, fair <laughs> point. Here's the weather. That warm feeling inside from Box Spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, western England and Wales, but further east, there's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather grey afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland. Scotland and Northern Ireland, but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again, 14 or 15 degrees. Into the evening, we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent, and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit drier here, and in any clear skies, we will see a touch of frost. So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall, though. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 
GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock, Sunday the 31st of March. Today, happy Easter Sunday. Religious figures and leaders celebrate across the world with the King set to join the rest of the royal family in Windsor. And as you wake up to presents from the Easter Bunny this morning, what's the best way to make sure you can eat your chocolate guilt-free? A new mega poll has revealed a <coughs> dire tale for the Conservative Party as they reach a record low, with even the Prime Minister likely to lose his seat. Happy Easter, unless you are a Conservative MP looking at these polls today. Really dire forecasts. I'll bring you the details shortly. Good morning. It's a huge day in the Premier League title race. Second place, Liverpool will expect to go top at Anfield when they kick off against Brighton at 2 o'clock. Then the big one. Treble winners Manchester City host leaders Arsenal at 4.30. We'll be looking ahead to both of those. Good morning. The clocks have sprung forward overnight, but for some of us, especially during Easter Monday, the weather is certainly not looking very spring-like at all. Find out all the information with me in a little bit. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Dawn Neeson, and we're wishing you the very happiest of Easter Sundays on Breakfast on GB News. Interesting on the clock change today, because mm. um, we were talking to a sleep expert earlier on, and the, and the sort of premise was that it can be very dangerous and dangerous on the roads, and how do we make it all safe and all the rest of it. Robert's been in touch and says, uh, many people live their lives going short of sleep. No one wants accidents on roads, at work, in the home, but you make this one hour sound like a national disaster. 
I think, Robert, you probably have a fair point there. We do make um, a lot of fuss about it, it, it don't do, we? It does happen twice a year, well, you know, forward and back, and, the, and we, we all manage, don't we? So I think, Robert, sensible view. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Um, maybe with lots of messages on chocolate as well, because obviously it's a day for chocolate at gbviews at gbnews.com if you want to have your say as well. Uh, Jack, good morning, Jack. Man after my own heart. I'm semi joking. Um, Jack says, um, instead of chocolate, I treat myself to a bottle of gin and it normally ends up with me upside down behind the TV. Well, A, that's not good health advice, by the way, and at least be in front of the TV so you can carry on watching us. Yeah, this is true. Uh, Michael has a very good point, though, because he was about having, you know, chocolate for breakfast and, oh, shock horror. Um, Michael says, nothing wrong with having chocolate for breakfast. Lots of people have chocolate spread on toast. Oh, yeah, or that's point. Pano chocolat yeah. or whatever. And mm -hmm. In fact, lots of people on the continent um, have sort of like a very thick hot chocolate mm -hmm. for, for, as, a, as a breakfast drink. Mm -hmm. He also says, why can you buy chocolate eggs, bunnies and all the rest of it, but not a chocolate crucifix? Hmm? It's supposed to be celebrating Jesus, not bunnies or eggs. Well, you know what? I think it's something like, on Easter Sunday, I think it's something like 80% of us think of chocolate before we think of um, what the day is actually about. Mm. Mm, that's probably true. Yeah. Um, I don't really know if a chocolate crucifix would be. It feels a bit wrong. Uh, so but you can get chocolate everything these days. You can get chocolate puppies. All yeah. for Easter. Yeah, Marks and Sparks, other supermarkets available. Do a, a chocolate puppy. Ooh. Mm. That's very odd, but no, a valid point. I don't think I'd want to eat a chocolate crucifix. Yeah, it feels a bit wrong. It does. It's a bit satanic. Well, I wouldn't go that far. Well, but, if, you would, if you eat it upside down, it probably would be. Oh, yes, all right. right. You've watched too many horror films, You sorry. have watched too yeah. many horror films, mm -hmm. I think. Um, anyway, keep your thoughts coming through today. It is Easter Sunday, and, of course, uh, many of us up and down the country will be celebrating perhaps heading to church. I mean, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. Uh, maybe a family lunch or perhaps just enjoying that chocolate. And our politicians have also released their Easter messages with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying, for many of us in the UK, Easter is a chance to pause and reflect and an opportunity to spend some precious time with our families and a moment to enjoy the start of spring. So this weekend, let me wish you all a very happy and peaceful Easter. Well, Sir Keir Starmer has said the Easter story is one of hope and renewal, of overcoming adversity and light prevailing over darkness. As families and friends gather to celebrate the holiday, we turn our thoughts towards new beginnings, our future and how things can change for the better. That's very subtle. I'm not getting any um, hidden messages in that at all. And please vote for me. <laughs> yeah. um, and, of course, today all eyes will be on Windsor as King Charles is set to join the royal family for their annual Easter service at St George's Chapel. Well, let's talk to a formidable royal correspondent, Michael Cole. Happy Easter, Michael. I mean, this is going to be quite something, actually, after everything that we know has been going on, uh, to see the King out and about today, even if only briefly, uh, will be something to yeah. celebrate. Happy Easter, Stephen. Happy Easter, Dawn. The King, you know, is a, a man of great faith, and he was determined to be at morning service today at Windsor, despite undergoing chemotherapy for his cancer. And he will be there uh, as protocol detects, uh, he will arrive last, and I suspect that he and Queen Camilla will arrive by car at the side door of the chapel, which is called the Gilbertus door, after other members of the family. Of course, royal ranks have been thinned in recent days by recent events. Here we see a procession at an earlier date. The people in the front there, of course, will not be there. Uh, the Prince and Princess of Wales and their children are Anne Mahal uh, on the Sandringham estate. I doubt that they will be seen. I doubt that they will go to St Mary Magdalene uh, Church at Sandringham for the morning service. Um, but other people will be there. Uh, to the dismay of some, of course, uh, the Duke of York, Prince Andrew, will probably be front and centre because in the absence of the Waleses and the Sussexes and their children also in California, um, he is the ranking royal. He's eighth in line to the throne, and his natural position would be at the front of the parade. That won't please everybody, of course. And uh, I'm quite sure that his ex-wife, Sarah, Duchess of York, will be there. And, of course, we mustn't forget that she is the third member, although a semi-detached member of the royal family, to be, to be undergoing cancer treatment. She had 
breast cancer last year, and it was recently revealed she had skin cancer. So good luck to everybody in the Royal Cancer Ward. We want to see them all fit and healthy, uh, not just this Easter, but throughout the many Easter's to come. It'll be a great day. Of course, it's the most significant day in the Christian calendar. It is, as you were saying earlier, uh, rebirth, renaissance, uh, resurrection, um, and, a, and a day for celebration. And the king takes great faith uh, and great comfort in, in his Christianity, as did his mother. Uh, and so uh, it will be an important day. And I think there will be a good crowd of of, of well-wishers. Perhaps you're going to ru rush down there as soon as the program is over to give them a cheer as they go in or as they go out. Yeah, that's a nice thought, Yeah, actually. it is. Michael, do you think it is a mistake for King Charles to offer the olive branch to Andrew in the way that he has? Well, he, of course, plays no royal role because of his disastrous and ill-judged friendship with the serial paedophile Jeffrey Epstein, unlamented by anybody who <clears throat> died in a prison cell in New York. Uh, because of that, he has no royal role and has no prospect of a royal role. But he is a member of the royal family. He is the Queen's second, late Queen's second son. He is his brother. Uh, that is a fact that we cannot get over. Uh, and maybe there is redemption for everybody. And perhaps that starts in St George's Chapel. Um, why is, I mean, I, I know there's the, the whole gender issues when it comes to the royal family, which, of course, have changed... Uh, with recent births, but but why now doesn't Princess Anne take a, mm. a, a leading role <laughs> in these sort of ceremonial things? Yes, of course, uh, things have been changed now, but it was male precedence when she was born and she uh, went after her brothers. That has all changed. It was one of the last great things the Queen did and had it agreed through the Commonwealth uh, that uh, regardless of gender, uh, the succession will go boy, girl, boy, girl, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but, of course, Princess Anne, and I'm glad you mentioned her, the Princess Royal, there she is uh, in sunnier climes, she will be there today, probably with her, her husband, uh, Vice Admiral Sir Timothy Lawrence, and her daughter, Zara, and her husband, Mike Tyndall, the inter rugby international. And um, also, we mustn't forget, because they're taking a more prominent role because of circumstances, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh, Edward and Sophie, and their two children, Lady Louise uh, Mountbatten-Windsor and their son, the Earl of Essex. So everybody's uh, lending their, their, their shoulder to the wheel, if you will. They're coming out, they're doing more. Uh, the king, I think, also wants to demonstrate, and he will be very pleased to see people there today, that he is out and about, that he's doing his job, that he's fulfilling his function as um, head of state and, of course, uh, commander of the... Um, the armed forces. And, of course, it is a very, very good thing that he is a sincere Christian because he is defender of the faith and he is the supreme governor of the Church of England. And the Angl Anglican expression of Christianity is something that uh, he and, as I say, the late Queen uh, took great comfort in. Mm. OK, Michael, really good to see Thank you this you, morning. Michael. Thanks very much indeed. I'm still not sure about the Andrew thing, I must admit. <clears> no, <throat> but I have to say, I'm glad the, 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 two, the two people, well, three people, um, Princess Anne has always been impressive, yep. but even more so over yep, the past few years. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I've got such respect for yep. her. Um, the Duke and Duchess of Edinburgh... Sophie. Fully on Team Sophie. Well, yes, but it's interesting because they sort of see, were in the spotlight for a long time. Mm. Um, and I, I don't know, I didn't have any disregard for them, but I didn't necessarily have any regard no. for them. And it's recently, in the in the wake of, of the passing of, of the late Queen and all the rest of it, they they are just working so hard yes. and just seem to be such good examples yeah. of, of what we want yeah. the royals to yeah. be that they've they've really shot up in my estimation. Yeah. Not that they care what I think. <laughs> um, but do you know what I mean? I really sort of think highly of them now, whereas I suppose I really didn't think of them No, before. but they, they've stepped up to the plate. They're oh, working really? very, very hard. Mm. And when you read about the relationship that Sophie in particular had with the late Queen... Mm. Um, and, the, it, and the Duke and, of Edinburgh. And the Duke of Edinburgh, absolutely. Mm. 
Um, OK, uh, but staying with Easter and the Easter message, in today's ever-increasing secular society, churches are finding it harder than ever to uh, have their messages heard and congregations are shrinking. So what role should churches be playing in our modern society? Well, our Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beattie has been to an outreach ministry in Belfast. We go out and, and reach people in society who are broken. Uh, many of them living on the streets. And when, when they live on the streets, 99% of them then get addicted to drugs uh, in some way. We bring them in and we offer them hope. Uh, the hope is found in Jesus Christ. Teen Challenge can't change anyone, but Jesus Christ can. Uh, and we, we make that plain to, to, to the folk uh, that there is a way out of addiction and there is a way out of the darkness and there is a way out of the pain and that there is hope. Our motto is putting hope within the reach of every addict and the hope, which is the name of this building, the hope is Jesus. Pastor Brian Madden leads Teen Challenge in Belfast and points to the need for a sense of belonging and belief. Everyone that comes in here belongs. They don't necessarily go to church, but they love coming here. They love coming to a Christian organization. They, they never, ever, ever refuse prayer. I just prayed with a young man there five minutes ago. I think it's the first time anyone has prayed for him in his life. When churches such as this one were first built, they were so much more than a place to worship. They projected power and social standing. They were a communication hub for the community. But do they still have the same relevance today? Buildings are, for their very nature, they're buildings that at one time could have fulfilled a, a very important function, and maybe they don't now. So if you think back to the earlier centuries, walking into a, a church building could have been a warm and comfortable space, a place where there was a sense of community, where they didn't have other grand buildings. Imagine walking into a cathedral and the high ceilings, the stained glass windows. The grandeur of it all just spoke of the majesty of God. Many churches are funding the HOPE project, and evangelist Keith Mitchell says churches may change, but their message must remain. So a core principle shouldn't change, and our method should always be one in terms of what is the culture saying around us and how do we engage in that culture in a way that we are, we are living out love and grace, but also we're embracing truth. We're not compromising on truth. And I think the church has a radical message of hope to still bring to the world today, and we do that in lots of different ways. So you might be looking at an old building now and say, you know, how is this relevant? But it's from the cafe at the side, and when people come in here on a Thursday night to worship, they see something contemporary, they see something new, they see something fresh. And in the world today, people need hope, and the church champions hope more than any other religious organization in the world. Doogie BD, GB News, Belfast. Well, as we already told you, uh, in, the, in his Easter message, the Prime Minister welcomed the opportunity to have a chance to pause and reflect, as he, of course, gears up for a general election. But a new mega poll in the Times newspaper has revealed the Conservatives are on track for their worst election results ever. Yeah, it found the Tories could win fewer than 100 seats, Labour having a majority, a majority of 286. It's on. Erdogan. That's literally everybody in there being Labour. Uh, let's talk to uh, political correspondent Catherine Forster now, who's brought the T's in and is now um, going to explain what this poll means. It, it's the most catastrophic news, basically, for the Conservative Party. Rishi Sunak talking about reflection. He'll be trying to take a day or so with his family. But, my goodness, this is terrible news for them. Just bear in mind that in 1997, when Tony Blair got that Labour landslide, the majority was 179. If, and it is a big if, things can always change, mm. if this poll turned out to be true, Keir Starmer would have a majority of 286. And as Sir Geoffrey Cox, <coughs> pardon me, said to our political editor Chris Hope a week or so ago on his podcast, it's not necessarily a great thing for any democracy for a party to have yes. such a huge majority because parties often will make bad decisions and if you have a massive majority, you can get pretty much anything through. But 
If this comes to pass, there will be no Conservative MPs in Scotland or in Wales. And, and looking at the map of this poll, even England, where you've normally got large swathes of blue in rural areas and down south, it's pretty much red in most places. Rishi Sunak may or may not cling on in his North Yorkshire seat. The Chancellor, too, both within the margin of error, but lots of very big beasts who might like Rishi Sunak's job uh, after the Conservatives lose, assuming that they do. People like Penny Mordaunt, mm -hmm. uh, leader of the House of Commons, people like James Cleverley, the Home Secretary, people like uh, Grant Shapps, the Defence Secretary, all set on these projections to lose their seats. Um, the one Tory leadership hopeful who looks pretty sure to hang on is Kemi Badenoch, mm. the business secretary. But, interestingly, this poll, polls have also suggested that um, if she was put in charge now, that would increase mm. the Labour lead in the polls right. by 4%. So there seem to be no good options for the Tories at the moment. People like Lord Frost, big Rishi Sunak critic, saying... Desperate situation. Current policies have alienated huge numbers of our voters. But what do they do? Because if they really take out another prime minister, that will add to the feeling of chaos. Is that really a good idea? Yeah, it absolutely would. I mean, the, the problem is with this, and I think it's partly it's a bigger problem because we, the public, are much more savvy than we used to be. Um, and the fact now that you have and will have... I mean, in a way, what else can they say? But you get Tory MPs on, you get ministers on, all mm. this, who, who then will say, of course we're fighting, of course we can win this election, when everything, everything says you don't stand a chance of, of getting back into power. This is where pe the distrust continues, because it's like you, you're not being even remotely honest with us. Well, I suppose they're not going to say, yes, we're going to lose. But, I mean, it's that catch-22, isn't it? It is. And, of course, they can't say that, can they? They can't no. say they've given up, though clearly uh, a lot of them, the prevailing mood seems to be that they feel that they are doomed. Um, and we've had, what, well over 60 Conservative MPs now say they're not standing again. Now, of course, it always happens, but the numbers are high and a lot of them are people that have not been in Parliament for, for very long, uh, and we've had James Heapy, who was um, the Armed Forces Minister, and Robert Halfen, who was a minister, stepping down on the same day mm. from those positions, not standing again in the next election. But, yeah, they, they can't admit it, but what do they do? Is there any way of triggering, of forcing Rishi Sunak's hand? <sighs> Even if in the wake of, say, May the 2nd and dreadful results? They can put in their letters of no confidence to Sir Graham Brady. We know that some have. Andrea Jenkins uh, very publicly many months ago. And some estimates that there's over 20 letters gone in. Truthfully, no one knows except Gray, Sir Graham Brady. But if they trigger a no confidence vote in May and he wins, he probably will win, but he will be weakened, which will damage them further. Uh, if he chose to walk away, well, I can't see it happening, but if they had somebody, who would they put in place? Mm -hmm. Because there is no agreement for who their best bet would be. Now, Penny Mordaunt seems to be the person who's feared most by Labour, but it looks like she's probably set to lose her seat, mm. maybe. Kemi Badenoch may still be there, but she's not necessarily that popular with floating voters. So it's... It, it's absolutely a nightmare for them. And some conversations now about um, uh, if Rishi Sunak tries to go for a summer election, people in Whitehall, ancient procedures and whatever being invoked to stop him. I mean, oh. it, there could be, I'm not saying there will be, but there could be even more chaos to come. And Dominic Cummings, remember him? Oh, um, yes, he's been... Uh, yeah, not a fan media. of the Conservative mm -hmm. Party at all, but he's been saying... Um, that Westminster has hugely underpriced the potential for chaos, basically, in the next few months. So just when they think it couldn't get any worse, um, very possibly could. <laughs> oh. Sorry to be such a ray of sunshine. No, no, Catherine, thanks very much. Happy indeed. Easter, Rishi. Oh.
Honestly, I, I wouldn't want to be waking I'm... up and seeing the papers every day. I would want oh politicians are a special breed because the people who want to be politicians, stuff they go through. I really wouldn't want to be doing that job oh, now, dear. would you? Certainly wouldn't. Um, right, it is 8.21. Let's have a look at other stories coming into the newsroom this morning. And churches are being <laughs> warned by the Home Secretary not to allow asylum seekers to exploit the system by converting to Christianity. James Cleverly says there's a real difference between welcoming a new member of the congregation and vouching for a person in an asylum tribunal. Mm. Meanwhile, the Metropolitan Police have arrested four people suspected of planning to disrupt the annual Oxford-Cambridge boat race on the River Thames yesterday. The force says it was made aware protesters were planning disruption, but officers were able to take swift action to intercept the plans. The Cambridge rowing to team claimed a double victory and the men and women's teams winning the historic race. But the rowers were warned not to jump in the water because of the high levels of E. coli. A new video has been released in the States showing the inside of the container ship that hit the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore on Tuesday. The footage was released by the NTSB, the uh, safety board. It's one of the first glimpses inside the vessel. That footage of that bridge and the inside the boat is amazing. And oh God! And I wouldn't Terrifying. want to be the divers going down to find the people that were still missing. No, it's horrible. It's isn't a very it? grim task. It's going to be yeah. a very long task to get it sorted out. Mm. All Godspeed to them. Yeah. Um, right. Let's see what the weather's going to do for you today. Here's Craig. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, western England and Wales, but further east, there's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather great afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland Scotland and Northern Ireland, but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again, 14 or 15 degrees. Into the evening, we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent, and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland a little bit drier here, and in any clear skies, we will see a touch of frost. So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall, though. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. <sighs> right, OK, chocolate. Should we talk chocolate? Um, Overindulging in Easter chocolate this morning. Well, we'll be looking at that next. This is GB News with Stephen and Dawn. Teams and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. This story caught my eye. Lloyds Bank, right, they own the insurance company Scottish Widows. They have now um, issued some kind of suggested guidance about which word to try and avoid, to try and avoid upsetting people or perhaps be as inclusive as possibly can be. One of these words is widows, which really caught my eye because of the amount of stupidity. If you own a brand literally called Scottish Widows, you can't then be saying that the word widows is triggering an offensive. Anyway, because it is so ludicrous, I need to move over from that part <laughs> because I want to talk about the broader issue. So yeah. many organisations, they have what they call ESG. I'm going to bring a graphic up on the screen uh, in case you're not familiar with what this is. But it's a sense of kind of government, and I would say it's almost like a spine. It underpins so much of what business does today. It stands for environmental, social and governance. And it's around things like um, how does a business perform when it comes to their environmental uh, impact? How diverse are their employees, how diverse is their board, and so on and so forth. 
Do you think ESG is a force for good and much needed within business or not, Ben? It is the introduction of systemic institutionalised prejudice in the United Kingdom, which is going to damage dreadfully our economy, but also our culture, our cohesion as a society, and it's undermining, again, coming back to it, the nation-state that is the United Kingdom. ESG has to be ditched. Mm, strong words, Judita. Do you agree with them? I don't agree because I think that with ESG, when you have them, what you're having an increase in is specialists in ESG being introduced into companies to, in, to kind of imbricate it into how the company functions. If you're moving in a direction of making your, com your company's functionality be optimized in a way that is inclusive of anyone from any background who has the qualifications to occupy that position, that is a good thing. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hello, welcome back and happy Easter Sunday. Now, today is one of the few days of the year where you can overindulge on chocolates and sweets without feeling guilty. Oh, can you? Oh, well, well many of not. us, of course, waking up to chocolate eggs for breakfast, perhaps. So, uh, we might be thinking whether or not it's OK to do so. Uh, so, what's the right amount of chocolate to... I can't believe I'm asking this. The right amount of chocolate to eat and is it ever OK to overindulge? Mm, well, let's talk to former presenter of Fat Families and friend of the show, Steve Miller. Good to see you this morning, Steve. I mean, put people right, will you? It's a disgrace. It's disgusting. All this chocolate eating. We should be having healthy vegetables and carrots and things for Easter, should we? None of this chocolate nonsense. Well, you sound very miserable this morning, I have to say, <laughs> because I actually think I actually think if, if you want a bit of chocolate, then have a bit of chocolate. You know, listen, you've got to be careful and moderate, of course, because if you want to go from a porker to a corker, so to speak, it is about how much you're putting in. I mean, the average bar of chocolate, I've got some figures for you somewhere, hang on a minute, Around uh, is around 100 milligrams, uh, sorry, 100 grams of chocolate is around is over 500 calories so oh it is it is a lot of calories and the the advice generally is to make sure that you're eating the darker chocolate rather than milk chocolate having said that the research as you can imagine is all over the place on this sort of stuff in america scientists did find that actually giving um it was it was a study with women and uh, giving them 100 grams of chocolate in the morning and at night actually helped them. It helped them to sleep better. It helped them to burn fat. Make of that whatever you want. But I say to people, yes, have a bit of chocolate. Enjoy it if you have an Easter egg today. Who cares? Because at the end of the day, you can get back on it, so to speak, tomorrow. Enjoy, you know, enjoy your day. Let's not that. all be miserable. I'll have that. I'd have that Easter egg that they're making on screen that one, now. Yeah. It's about six <laughs> feet tall. It's like the NHS, about, don't eat a whole one in one go. Well, I'll try. But, Steve, the problem I have with this, right, OK, is, like, you, you say, you know, you make up for it tomorrow, and it's like, well, if I... I'm going to wake up feeling... If I eat loads of chocolate today, and I've already started, by the way, um, I, I am going to feel guilty, but that's not going to help me mentally tomorrow, is it, really? Oh, it depends how you approach the chocolate. I mean, I today will definitely get one of those cream eggs because I like chopping the top off and putting my finger in and having a good lick of the yolk, the sweet yolk that's in it. I won't feel guilty tomorrow. What I say to people is, you know, in your mind today, tell yourself that you're going to enjoy it, you're OK to enjoy it, but you'll be very focused over the next few days. I've always advocated 
80% eat healthy, 20% a bit of what you fancy. And if you want a bit of egg, have a bit of egg. Chocolate egg, that is, today. Absolutely. It's a bit of... But I find... I mean, the, the, men, the mental side of it is quite interesting. Yeah. I find it a slippery slope. If I get on a diet and and I'm start to, to lose uh, a few pounds. I feel great, I can keep on it, I can focus. The minute I slip, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, I'm definitely slipped at the moment, <laughs> Steve, um, then it all just it all just goes out the window and I can't, you know, if there's a bit of chocolate, I have it. Oh well you're absolutely right to raise the mental side of it. It is mindset and motivation. I and mean, in this country we talk about food too much when it comes to weight loss. You know, so so what can we do? Well, today, if you've got lots of Easter eggs in, for example, put a warning sign in front of them. Uh, you know, or it could be a pleasant sign, such as I am too gorgeous to be fat. That'll just make you stop, look and listen before you you perhaps grab an egg when you shouldn't. And, and you know, also, I, and this is going to sound like I need sectioning, but I get people to actually talk to the food as well because it's food controls us. There is method in my madness. So food can control us, obviously. So we have to learn to control it. Now, it, we do that by actually conversing with it mentally in our mind so that we're actually telling it, actually, I've got the control. I'm the gaffer here, not you. Cream eggs, chocolate eggs, whatever eggs today. You know, you're the one in control. And you're actually telling it. I even get people to wink at it. And there is a method in my madness, like I say, because it is about food control. It's not about weight loss. It's about weight control. It's all here. So what I say to the viewers is today, yes, tell yourself you're too gorgeous to be fat. Tell yourself as you're looking at it that you have the control and also have things around you, visual things around you that actually feed your mind and, and lift your spirit so that you're not emotionally eating. Because often we go to the chocolate if we're feeling a bit down. And that might be things like, you know, photos of the holiday that you're going to go on soon or oh, the oh, items yeah. of clothing that you're going to be wear, mm. you, you're going to be fitting into. Put them around the house. Look at them. Let it motivate you. Let's not make it doom and gloom. But coming back, it is Easter Sunday. So I say to people, if you want a bit of egg today, chocolate egg, you go and enjoy it. You're always sensible. That's good That's ideas. really sensible. Steve, thank you so much. And happy Easter you're to welcome. you and yours. Have a wonderful day. I, I, I do try talking to my chocolate eggs, but they answer back. That's the problem. Uh, it's like, come on, eat me. You know you want me. It, but it is getting your head in the same. It's like giving up smoking. You can't. You can't tell. Yeah. You can't make someone give up smoking. You've got to want to do it. Really want to. And it's the same with food. Yeah. It's the same. I with just food. don't want it hard enough, do I? No. no. Well, you're all right. <laughs> uh, all right. Ada McGee's got your sport in just a moment. Morning. Yes, indeed. Good morning to you. It's all about the Premier League title race this afternoon. The top three all in action. Liverpool up first at two o'clock against Brighton. And then at 4.30, it's Man City against Arsenal. The big one, we'll be looking ahead to both after this break. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Shocking new study says that vaping might be linked to cancer. Not that shocking. It found e-cigarettes can cause similar DNA changes to cells as smoking, leading experts to claim that vaping does not seem as harmless as originally billed. So joining us now is Robert Sidebottom from the UK Vaping Industry Association. Good morning, Robert. Um, is this terrible news for your industry? I imagine you're going to try and defend uh, the product still and say that there's still a lot more research to be done. Well, I don't need to really defend the product because I think actually if you read the article and you read the detail in the article, I mean, it actually starts and it states with, while this doesn't mean that vaping has the same degree of cancer risks as, as smoking does, it implies that vaping may have negative health impacts. However, we've, we've never said that vaping is completely risk-free. And we've always said that it is 95% safer than smoking, which it is. We accept that further research needs to be done. And actually, we welcome studies into the health impact of vaping, as we want to give every former smoker the full confidence that vaping is considerably safer than smoking. And that's, yeah, it, that's the important message. But that's about the former smokers. What about the young people who are taking up vaping, Robert? It's better, these, not these to vape. it's better not to vape at all, and we know why they take up smoking, because you lure them into your shops with silly flavours called bubblegum. Well, we can get into the flavour debate. That's no problem at all, because, you know, adults like flavours. I, you know, particularly I love squashy sweets. But these products, and let's be absolutely clear, are not for children. They are an age-gated mm -hmm. product. 
that are for adults only. And, hope and that is exactly who they should be and sold hopefully, to. Hopefully, um, I'm so sorry, Rob, we've run out of time, but and hopefully oh. this research will show that they certainly are not for children. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Eight thirty-seven. Should we have a chat with Aidan? Morning. Good morning again. Morning. What do you want to kick off with? Kick off. Look, let's touch on May ninety because I think it's best that we get them out of the way. They'll be pleased about that as well because it was a disappointing <laughs> result for them. Actually, I say disappointing result. It actually wasn't. They were absolutely hammered in terms of the ter territory. The, the amount of shots they conceded. This is a top six side conceding thirty-three mm -hmm. shots on target. That's an average. Given that the game lasted ninety-nine minutes, I think that's an average of about once every three that's minutes a or lot. something. It is. So they got away with it, conceding one goal. The Brentford manager, manager Thomas Frank was saying, I almost lost faith in the football god because he was saying, well, you know, how can we dominate this game? so much we can pepper their goal with shots and yet still we can end up losing this game nonetheless though Stephen May United took the lead six minutes into added time if you're a top club with ambitions about winning, or winning trophies and the mentality and the culture is right you see that out yeah, yeah, yeah. Six minutes into added time, and you can still concede a goal. I mean, that happens so rarely in football. And so, when, mind you, we get so much added time these days, it's eminently we possible, I guess. We managed to do it quite it? well. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know. Well, there was West... And don't forget West Ham as well. We should, we touched on those earlier on, didn't mm. we? But, oh, um, yeah. yeah. Three, one up, three, three one up with 14 minutes to go. Calvin Phillips comes on, and the whole team wrecked the thing. Yeah. But looking ahead today... Talk about pulling... Defeat from the jaws of victory. We do exactly. that. We, we're quite good. It's, it's our skill. Yeah. It's unique. <laughs> but uh, looking ahead this afternoon, it's huge. The top three all in action. Liverpool fresh out the blocks at two o'clock against Brighton. If they win that, then they go top. They're, they, they're currently second, and that, that gives Man City and Arsenal a bit to do this afternoon. If Liverpool were to lose, and this is an interesting scenario, I was chatting to someone backstage about this, and I was saying, if Liverpool lose... Then the winner of Arsenal v Man v versus Manchester City has a real incentive there because they can effectively win two matches because Liverpool will be knocked back a little bit from their defeat if they lose oh, yeah. and they beat Manchester City. Don't think it's a three-way contest and the incentive there is huge. And I think that we're going to see both teams attack each other like never before at 4.30. You're talking about the treble winners here. You're talking about the leaders in the Premier League with, who've, had, who've won the last eight matches, scoring goals are plenty. This is why this match and these matches between these top three sides in the Premier League are up there with the Super Bowl in terms of international interest, does global that, interest. But does that mean then, because you say... If Liverpool lose, it's almost like a double win for... for Whoever Liverpool. wins... So, so, is that, so does that make it a must-win for Liverpool, does it? Oh, without doubt. Well, you, you have to. You, you've, in a title race like this, when nobody slips up anymore... I mean, we had a title race, mm. I think it was in 2019, when uh, Liverpool and, and Man City went at the last yeah. nine, ten games, and neither of them gave, gave an inch. And it was only because City were ahead... A, 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 a point earlier in, in the season that got them over the line later on. So you can't, you, you can't lose more than two, three games now in a season. I mean, I remember United and Arsenal used to win the title on 80 points. Now mm. you need close to 100, and you might even win it. Liverpool won it on 99 points, I think, yeah, no, a few absolutely. years ago. It's astonishing. That's the level these clubs are setting. And that's why Mikel Arteta have said before this game that Manchester City have set a level of football that has never been seen before. And you know what? Given the point situation, I think they've met the facts probably back him up. Mm. But it is quite exciting at the moment, though. Oh, without I mean, doubt. It, it, yeah. yeah, rather than just, oh, it's going to be them again. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we've, we've known... There have been a few times in the last four or five years where we've known who this is going to win the title in probably February. And then, see, then we yeah. so to, see, to see a title race, it makes it more interesting for us to talk about. Yeah. Even if you only have a passing interest in football, you're more likely to, to drop into it if there's an actual competition going on rather than just a processional race to the finish. Mm. Yeah. No. Or run to the finish, not even a race. No. Well, yeah. But it's going to be exciting. 4.30 at the Etihad. 
had, as I say, a global TV audience well into the probably over 100 million, I would have thought. So we know what your wow. afternoon consists of. Yeah, I'm going to have a sleep first, though. Sleep <laughs> first, and then yeah. a full afternoon of football. Without doubt, a feast of football. A and feast, I, a feast, I just want to say thank you very much for our Easter eggs. Oh, just don't worry at all. Yeah. So we're going to have to, as Steve Miller would say, have a good talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> and, mine's, mine's definitely not listening. And then we'll leave them. Yeah, um, more sense out of them than me, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Aiden, <laughs> thanks for Good to see you. Happy thanks, Easter, Aiden. Both. Uh, right, we've got uh, the stories from the newspapers this Easter Sunday heading away in just a moment with Emma Wolf and Tom Slater. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this, you said it again recently. You made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. The question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope. I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple and hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? NATO has to treat the U.S. fairly, because if it's not for the United States, NATO literally doesn't even exist. But they took advantage of us, like most countries do. If they start to pay their bills properly, and the club is fair, are places like Poland defended? Will America be there? I believe the United States was paying 90 percent of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO. It could be 100 yep. percent. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between some problems. It's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there? Yes, 100 percent, 100 percent. Thank you. Uh, let's see what's in the papers then and making the news this morning with the writer Emma Wolf and the editor of Spiked, Tom Slater. Morning. Good morning, morning. good back. morning. Um, ooh, where's my list? Here we go. I've got a little list somewhere. You ha you've got a list. I have an ugly question. Oh, no, I've got, no, I've got, no, I've got, I've got both. I've on got the front of the Express. I've been, I've been list. hogging them. <laughs> Emma, oh. let's have a look at the front of the Sunday Express, should we? Yeah. Um, and, Alzheimer's prevention jab. Yeah, well, I mean... Sounds too good to be true. It does, it does, and it's very, very exciting. It could potentially be a real breakthrough for a lot of people in this country. 900,000 people in the UK are, are afflicted by dementia. I, I, sh I should think it's more than that, you know. We yeah. know a lot of old people yeah. who, are, who are losing their memory and don't want to call it dementia, but anyway, and it could be up to 1.6 million people by 2040. You know, and we're all living longer, and it, this is a degenerative 
cancer, of brain disease. So there's this new drug, a uh, game-changing vaccine, it's been called. Um, and what it does is it removes those toxic proteins from the brain, these amyloids that clump together, and that's what causes dementia. Mm. They're naturally occurring proteins, but they're not helpful in old age, um, and they cause the damage. So this is, again, it's one of those drugs that should be widely available in five years' time. It always seems yeah. to be five or six years five away, years. doesn't it, with a cure for cancer or whatever. So there's still some, some more human trials to be There are, yeah, it's undergoing trials at the moment. There's a policeman who's been talking, a um, uh, former senior police officer who developed Alzheimer's and is taking part in these trials. He says it's changed his life already. All oh, right, so it's so it will actually work for people who've already developed some stages. Yeah, of it. yeah. So he's undergoing the trials at the moment. He's part of this two-phase trial, and he says it's transformed his life after three jabs, which is very, wow, very exciting that's amazing. for people that have already started that yeah. process. You know, because yeah. you think, well, will it be too late or whatever? But and considering it yeah. is increasing and people yeah. are developing it younger and younger, mm. as younger well, and younger, yeah. and, and living longer. So living longer with something like yes. that for twenty yeah. years rather yeah. than sort of you know getting to retirement age and then having a few years left of life. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. let's see, and also the cost and the availability. These are all questions that the NHS is going to have to. Well, it's more, it's more pressure on the NHS, mm -hmm. but these are, this is where you need to prioritise. Yeah. I know it sounds controversial, I'd prioritise this over no, something you like have to. IVF. I think you have to. I think you really have to. I mean, oh, no. you know, we had a loved one in the hospital recently and everyone else on the ward was suffering from dementia, many of them very elderly, very mm. lonely, no visitors. Absolutely heartbreaking to witness. It really was. It's just yeah. the most horrific way to lose someone you love. Well, fingers crossed for that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tom, too much information. Yes. So I haven't told you anything yet. <laughs> no, in the break. Oh. There's a lot of TMI going <laughs> on this panel. No, so this is a, a poll that's been conducted into TMI, too much information, and basically people's, people have had enough of it. So about a fifth of... Brits say they are often on the receiving end of confessions they would prefer not to have heard. Oh, really? Um, and apparently, Norfolk, the worst offenders. Oh, but, well. But that kind of makes sense when oh, you... Yeah. Uh, How want... random, Norfolk. I can, I can understand. <laughs> Overshare in Norfolk. Overshare. <laughs> There's an interesting generational difference. What happened to you in Norfolk? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that probably... Would, uh, wouldn't do to mention that, but no, it seems like there's a generational difference as well. So the younger generation, this I found interesting, like Generation Z, are more most bothered by it than older generations. But maybe that's because they're subjected to more of it in this kind of tell-all age that we we find ourselves in. I think but... it's because the younger generation, reality isn't what you share. You sh you share a fabricated reality, mm. don't you, mm. on, with filters and Instagram and. Like it's a weird world, though, because, like, social media and WhatsApp and things like that, there, often there are people that you barely know and that you have actually oh, gosh, messaged yeah. endlessly. I mean, there are yeah. people that I don't think I've actually met in real life yeah. who are cl some of my closest friends and you tell each other everything. So it's yeah. a kind of... Yeah. It's a weird... Are, are we talking separate, about... But we're very, very close. Are we yeah. talking about social media here or is it just sort of sitting talking face-to-face? -face no one, no like one meets and talks. Yeah. <laughs> it, seems like, it seems like a mix of things. But I, I think you're right, Steve, as far as that sort of gap, because... The kind of caricature is that the sort of older Facebook users say will just kind of spill all and constantly put up photos and talk about themselves, whatever. The young generation is much more curated. It's much more about yeah. one yeah. often quite heavily doctored image, which they kind of will put out and broadcast yeah. the world. So they Not can definitely real. see that different. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't. I don't. Well, I don't overshare on social media because um, there's just so much. That you, you put anything on. You think you can put something on that you think is nice, and you get mm. criticism. Mm. Um... And people are so quick to criticise on there. They say things on there that would never say to your face. Social media can be really dangerous as well. The other day I was doing a TV thing and someone said they were going on holiday and when we all just suddenly thought, oh, my God, burglaries. Yeah. You know, yeah, you, yeah. Got, yeah. you have to think about what yes. you're actually oh, saying yeah. in the yeah. public domain. Yeah. yeah. No, it's sort of funny. Yeah. No, yeah. no one knows. Um, now, um, Sunday Mirror has... Um, I'm a celeb winner, Giovanna something or other. <laughs> She's with... called Giovanna Fletcher. She, is, oh, Fletcher. she does this podcast about motherhood and babies and things like that, and right. she won I'm a Celeb in right. 2022. Right. But um, she's been talking about um, her friendship or her, her, her sort of, you know, acquaintance with Kate, um, with the princess, with, with Catherine. And she's been saying how lovely Kate is and how much she connects with people. She's been talking about her sort of dignity and her grace and her compassion and how she really seems to reach out to people. And that's why the news has affected so many. I think Kate is very, very beloved in this country. I think we saw that recently at the, at the shock of her, of her announcement and the sort of genuine sadness from people. Um, so this, yeah, this mm. woman has been saying how she, she, you know, she remembers people. She remembers to ask after their children and really cares about so, others. Mm. Is this a is this a, a friend of the Princess of Wales or is this 
the princess, you know, the, the someone with a podcast to sell. Someone with a podcast mm. who has met the princess <laughs> of Wales. I know. She's I think so she's, wonderful. It's quite a tenuous link, and she's you know my mate Kate. That's why I said she's yeah. an acquaintance of her because I don't think she particularly knows her that well. But uh, she's you know everybody's talking about their knowledge of the of the princess, and uh, this one is obviously another one. Yeah, mm. you've never been in roughly in the same room as um, the princess of in Wales. The same... You two can get a. Front page. Exactly. It's, in the same yeah. county, even. <laughs> it's, well, it's like showbiz friends. You get a, a lot of that in the world of showbiz. Um, I went to I went to a party once, I was, um, and there was it was full of everybody was there. Someone's birthday party, <clears> and everybody was there. And he said, like, "Well, hey, I, I know the party boy hates you, and he doesn't know you." <laughs> it was yeah. all that sort of thing. Yeah. It looked good for the, looked good for the photographers. Well, I met Keir Starmer last week and he's now my best mate. And he's not at all. He wouldn't know me from Adam. No. But from that five-minute meeting, he's my best friend and I refer to him, you know, on a daily basis. Oh, yes. <laughs> my mate Keir? Yeah, my well, mate why Keir. not? Because Next Prime Minister, you know. Prime Minister, we get yeah. way back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm so. fascinated by this story, Tom. Um, the uh, Telegraph, page six story. Yes. So this... Is this more wokeness going on? It seems like it. So there's Oriel College, Oxford, um, which has had a fair few of these kind of scandals in, in recent years. So it has a portrait of this 18th century Duke, the fifth Duke of Beaufort, who um, usually hangs in the library there. But because of the fact that in the background there's an image of a black boy seemingly as like a servant or holding his coronet, that um, according to one source at the college, it's been removed um, because of offence or because of the potential for offence. Um, the college has otherwise claimed that actually this is because they're undergoing works or whatever, but he's this particular source is disputing that. Oriel is, is an interesting one as far as... as far as it's been the focus for a lot of these campaigns, where everyone remembers the Roads uh -huh. Must Fall campaign, mm -hmm. uh -huh. which is still on the outside of the college there. And just this kind of preoccupation so much with, again, just the kind of objects and the historical paintings and things like that. The idea that, that just the presence of these things, which have been hanging in this library or whatever for quite a long time. And it's also big... It becomes this big problem because of the fact that often these, uh, as in this case, an image of a former graduate of the college and benefactor and now they're in this situation where they're having to kind of purge their own history because of what is the perceived offence. And I think that's the other really important perceived. thing. To say. They're, what, they're running scared of this imagined student who will mm -hmm. be terribly upset by mm -hmm. absolutely everything they see. Yeah. To the extent that those students exist, I, I can't imagine they're very... I bet many. not a single student's complained about it. Is that Probably the never even the noticed it. They do it preemptively now, which I think is a really it's weird It's ridiculous. Um, we're, we're down to... Um, about a minute. Well, so, I'm nervously holding my chocolate egg on my... my, my, my it's probably melting. ..Terry's orange on my lap, because I suddenly realise you're a Terry's chocolate orange obsessive. That, well, and, I am. And this has just been given to me by Aidan McGee, sports journalist <laughs> extraordinaire. And yeah. now I, I can't leave he's, it in the studio anywhere, because you all probably go for it. it. He's given... We, we've all uh, got, have you got better ones? He's brought Easter eggs in for everyone. Other oh, chocolate, oh, other chocolate eggs amazing. are available, <laughs> yes, they by are. the way. Can we just very, very, very quickly then look at this advert for an exorcist? Yes. On the Daily Star Sunday. Because appa appa apparently, an yeah, exorcist. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, there. Can't be that, can you? It's up 60%. So, um, exorcists and ghostbusters in particular, apparently um, in, in big demand. But, you know, you read some of the examples here, and I dare say, this, you know, they're hearing noises in the walls. Probably need an exterminator rather than an exorcist, I dare say. But yes, apparently more people are, are going to them looking for help with bangs in the night and things of that. Has this got anything to do with the fact the new Ghostbusters movie is coming out? It could well be, you know. Just puts the idea Ooh. in people's head, maybe, somehow. Mm, subconsciously. Call me a cynic. Yeah, and they're showing the old ones on TV at the moment yeah. every Easter. Tracking. Um, yeah. Emma, yeah. Tom, thank, thank you very much. Very thank much you. Thank Good you. to see you this Happy morning. Um, let's get a check on your Easter weather with Craig. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well, today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, western England and Wales, but further east, it's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather great afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland and Northern Ireland, but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again, 14 or 15 degrees. 
into the evening, we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent, and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday. But all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit dry here, and in any clear skies we will see a touch of frost. So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall, though, but all the time, Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. warm feeling inside from boxed boilers sponsors of weather on gb news patrick christie's tonight weekdays from 9 p.m has the nhs killed your relative and then lied to you about it there is an alleged cover-up culture in the NHS. They lie to you about why your loved one died, about poor care, then bury documents with evidence in them, and they try to silence staff who speak out. This is according to the NHS Ombudsman. There are around 11,000 avoidable deaths every year. 11,000. Someone's mum dies, their children know something dodgy happened, and then they're met with a rotten culture, including the altering of care plans, the disappearance of crucial documents, and complete denials. They lie to you, but they really get away with it because the NHS is like a religion and people dare not criticise it. You'd be accused of nhs phobia. The annual budget is around £180 billion and we now have about 2 million people working for the NHS. They cannot keep blaming everything on being underfunded and understaffed. If they're covering up medical negligence, it means the problem doesn't get dealt with and it keeps happening. And that is the fault of the NHS managers, the people who run it, They've got the money for 837 non-clinical staff working at English hospitals on the highest paid Band 9 contracts, which is between £99,000 and £115,000 a year. How many nurses would that pay for? How many junior doctors? And they've got the time on their hands to think about making the NHS the world's first carbon-neutral health service. They've got time to consider whether women in labour should be picked up by an electric ambulance that might have to be recharged en route to the hospital. There are NHS managers with a budget of £180 billion, 2 million members of staff, and they're crying about being understaffed and under-resourced. If they spent more time looking after patients instead of finding ways to cover up avoidable deaths, then maybe we'd have a better health service. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Very good morning to you. Nine o'clock on Sunday, the 31st of March. Today, happy Easter Sunday. Leaders and religious figures celebrate across the world and the King is set to join the rest of the royal family in Windsor. Build back service for the King, the most significant public appearance of His Majesty since his cancer diagnosis. So is this a sign things are heading in the right direction? Find out shortly. And as you wake up to presents from the Easter Bunny this morning, what's the best way to make sure you can eat your chocolate guilt-free? A new mega poll has revealed a dire tale for the Conservative Party as they reach a record low. Even the Prime Minister could potentially lose his seat.
Good morning. The clocks have sprung forward overnight, but for some of us, especially during Easter Monday, the weather is certainly not looking very spring-like at all. Find out all the information with me in a little bit. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Dawn Neeson. This is Breakfast on GB News. Wishing you a very, very happy Easter Sunday. Yeah, and I hope you're sort of gearing yourself up for a nice Easter Sunday and uh, whether or not you're having chocolate, um, that you have hopefully go to church and that you can also have yeah. uh, time with family and friends as well. Enjoy some peace. Talking of time, though, you have got an hour less today to enjoy that chocolate or your loved ones because... The clocks went forward, so it is actually one minute past nine now, not one minute past eight, if you haven't done the, the twiddly yes, bit. Yes, if you're wondering if our clock's wrong mm. on the screen. No. Sadly, it's not. No, it's you. No. Sorry. Anyway, look, it is Easter Sunday. People up and down the country will be celebrating. As I say, going to church to mark the resurrection of Christ. Maybe you're just uh, having lunch with family, or perhaps, like Dawn, just eating those... Chocolate eggs. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not the only one. Um, and our politicians have also released their Easter messages with Prime Minister Rishi Sunak saying, For many of us in the UK, Easter is a chance to pause and reflect and an opportunity to spend some precious time with our families and a moment to enjoy the start of spring. So this weekend, let me wish you all a very happy and peaceful Easter. Um, the leader of the opposition, Shakir Starmer, couldn't resist making his... Uh, a thinly veiled political <laughs> message, it's got to be said. Um, he said, the Easter story is one of hope and renewal, of overcoming adversity and light prevailing over darkness. As families and friends gather to celebrate the holiday, we turn our thoughts towards new beginnings, our future and how things can change for the better. That is the least thinly vowed thing since the history of thinly vowed things. Um, and of course, uh, all eyes will be on Windsor as King Charles is set to join the royal family for their annual Easter service at St George's Chapel. And let's talk to our royal correspondent, Cameron Walker. Uh, and, and there has been a real determination, Cameron, hasn't there, for the, the king to make sure he is there today? Yeah, absolutely, Stephen. Happy Easter to you both. It is, I think, a sign of reassurance that His Majesty the King really is determined to be uh, on what it will be his most significant public engagement since his cancer diagnosis. And also, I was surprised because Buckingham Palace confirms this news uh, earlier uh, this week, at the start of last week. Um, and I was expecting, we were led to believe that we would not have his attendance confirmed until the day itself. Now, what happens just before this announcement from Buckingham Palace? The Princess of Wales revealed that she herself is undergoing preventative chemotherapy and has been diagnosed with cancer as well, which clearly shocks the country, shocks the world. And I'm getting the sense that Buckingham Palace and His Majesty the King really wanted to provide that reassurance to the public. And according to a source speaking to The Telegraph this morning, it's a sign things are heading in the right direction when it comes to the King's recovery. Now, it is going to be a scaled back service. That's on doctor's advice. It's understood the King can't be around too many crowds at the moment. That's why we did not see him at the Worcester Cathedral Maundy service on Thursday. The Queen was there um, in, uh, in his place or, or instead of him. Uh, but there will be other members of the royal family attending this service in Windsor later on. We don't know which members of the royal family. What we do know is that it will not be the Prince and Princess of Wales or Prince George, Princess Charlotte or Prince Louis. They are taking Easter out to come to terms with the Princess of Wales's uh, cancer diagnosis. So there will be a bit of a turnout, um, but perhaps the, the headline is His Majesty the King will be there. Cameron, do you think that he'll be more determined to do it because of Catherine's situation? <laughs> Yeah, I think he would actually, Dawn. Uh, he, he's a bit of a workaholic, as he, he and his aides have said publicly uh, in the past. And I think from what his uh, nie not niece, nephew said to an Australian channel a couple of weeks ago, uh, the king is getting a bit frustrated. This is Peter Phillips I'm talking about, to, to, uh, speaking to a journalist. He said he's getting frustrated that he can't do the things that he would like mm. to, having to scale back, having to cancel engagements, having to uh, let other members of, of the royal family do it on his behalf. And 
you know, the chapel itself is technically in his own house, isn't it? Windsor Castle is one of his many properties. It's not exactly a big uh, ask to walk down or be driven down to the chapel to then sit inside. So the king will very much want to do that, but doctors will clearly be wary because of the kind of treatment he's undergoing. He cannot be around too many people to stop to stop infections. That That's the reason. So it's been adjusted for His Majesty. It's been scaled back, but it's definitely not been cancelled, and he would be very determined, I think, to be there today. Mm. Okay. Cameron, thanks Cameron, very much indeed. Uh, now, coming up at 9.30 this morning, we've got a special. Uh, Dame Marlene Foster is hosting a special GB News Easter Sunday show, mm. and she's here. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Happy Easter. Happy, Happy Easter. Easter. Before we talk about the show, mm. can I ask you about Northern Ireland? Yes. Because um, obviously there's been charges laid against the leader of the DUP. He's mm. had to step back, and all it's it's you know that, we allow that to run its course. Sure. However, um, what does that mean for stability of power sharing in Northern Ireland, which is of course only just resumed? Mm. It has only just resumed, and I think a lot of people are concerned about that. But the interim leader is Gavin Robinson. He has stepped in. He has been deputy leader now for some time. He's a very well respected individual across the political spectrum. Um, he's very well respected for his seriousness, and uh, I think he will bring stability to what is a terrible shock for everybody in Northern Ireland, not just in the party. Mm. Um, and I think he will provide that stability and I think the institutions will continue along. It's, of course, as you say, very soon back. You know, mm. I mean, they just came back and this happened. So it's, it's a huge shock for everybody. But I think Gavin will provide stability. OK. Mm. So what's coming up on the show? You mentioned having three Frenchmen. Yes. Which got us both very excited, to be honest Not with one, you. not two, but three Frenchmen are coming in to talk about hot cross buns. <laughs> and they're bringing hot cross buns as well, so you might want to hang about for that. Um, we're also going to be looking at the papers, obviously. And that poll, that very important poll that has yes. come out today about the Tory party, I'll be looking at that with a former head of press from Number 10. So we're taking a look at some of the polls that are out there at the moment. I mean, what, what do you make of that? I, I mean... It's, it's, I mean, I'm absolutely blown away by mm. it. The idea that any party could have a 246 mm. or was it 86 seat majority is just unbelievable. Yeah, well, it would be historic, of course, if it did happen. And these are just polls. And as a former politician, polls are polls. What <laughs> happens on the day is, is something very different. Um, but, you know, it is an indication that things are not getting any better for the Tory party. Um, and we've heard some voices within the Tory party saying, look, we need to do something here. If we keep doing what we're doing, then we are going to end up with a historic low. Uh, people like David Frost, obviously, Robert Jenrick are saying, look, we need to change course here. So it'll be interesting to see what happens post-Easter. Politi politically, what do you think the thinking is? Because I was saying earlier on, I don't understand the political thinking in a way, because the, the, the public are getting frustrated mm. now. Yeah. My, my, if I was talking to the, to the Prime Minister, I'd say, just call it. Just get on with it now. We need to know what's going on. Obviously, politically, that isn't necessarily what you want to do. So what, what will he be thinking? You understand the mindset better than the rest of <laughs> do us. Do you think so? Yes, I do. <laughs> no, well, I think we're all... When we had the budget, I think some of us were expecting a bit more. And so I think there's going to be another fiscal event. This is what they're planning, probably, for early September, October time. If that's to happen, then they're hoping that that will give them a bit of a, a lift at the time. So I don't think you will see a poll until the autumn time. Right. OK. Sorry about um, that. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no I, just want to, I just want to crack on. Can I ask about, um, obviously, Easter Sunday? Yes. But the importance of it, I mean, particularly uh, in Northern Ireland, where it's obviously... In, in a sense, I would, I would imagine Northern Ireland is still sort of more Christian, in a way, in terms of how people view themselves and, than perhaps the mainland. But how important is it to you mm. as an individual to mark this this important weekend, but today to, to look at the resurrection of Christ mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea that our, you know, our, our sins are are taken away from us. We have a chance to repent. Well, as a Christian, Easter is the high point, if you like. Easter Sunday is the high point of the year because it is when we celebrate the resurrection, that key central part of your faith. Uh, and I'll be speaking to Dr Gavin Ashenden, who's going to explain why Easter is so important to so many of us and, and to take a look back over all of that. Of course, he was the former chaplain to the late Queen. We all know how important Easter and Christianity was mm. to the late Queen. Mm. And I think it's wonderful that the King is going to make an appearance today mm. at Easter because Easter is about hope. 
It's about renewal, uh, and I think the fact that he's going to church today is a really strong statement. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is. is. Arlene, Lovely. brilliant. Uh, look forward to seeing it half uh, half done and yeah. enjoy the hot cross buns. Yes, <laughs> and the Frenchman. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Disgraceful. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, uh, let's just take you to uh, the Vatican, actually. Three. Um, because uh, yeah, three mass days is, afterwards. Easter Mass is underway uh, with Pope Francis. Now, of course, he's not been. He's not been in the best of no, health. No, he's not been one of himself. Um, but he has been, and we know he's, he, he missed a couple of events over the weekend, uh, But he, because he said he wanted to, to keep his strength for today. As Ali mm. said, the most important day in the Christian calendar. Mm. Mm. We've had a glimpse of him there on these close-ups, have we? And no, we haven't. The I, I think what the one thing... I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have a faith like Arlene does, but I think the one thing that I, I think concerns me about Easter at the moment is how little people actually understand about the religious significance of Easter. We know more about the Easter bunny and chocolate than we do about, you know, what happened and why we celebrate Easter. But that's that's a commercialisation, isn't it? It's, as, yeah. it's the same with it's the same with Christmas and, mm. and all, mm. all the big events mm. actually. But but it's it's things like this mm. which uh, which should bring it home to us. Yeah. As uh, in this obviously case, the Catholic Church, yeah. but of course, uh, Protestants and Anglicans around the world celebrating too uh, the the resurrection of Jesus after three days in the tomb <clears throat> and what that signifies for our future mm. and the, uh, the sting of death, as they say, you know, the, being the, removed. The, you really hope that the message coming from this Easter globally is of regeneration, rebirth and hope. Well... <clears throat> I think that's the most important thing. I think we are um, in desperate need of that. Yeah, very much to so. Be, to be fair, yeah. we, we do need hope. We desperately need peace in the world mm. at the moment. There's a lot of hatred, a lot of anger, a lot of tribalism, really, which yeah. is problematic, yeah. and we do need to try and deal with that. And people that. try and blame religion for that, but it's not religion that causes that. It's the people that are causing that. That's mm. not what any religion teaches. No, no, it isn't. Um, OK, we're going to take a short break. Back in just a moment. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Can the Church of England not spend their money as they wish? The Church of England can do amazing things for this country and for the world. And I'm not sure why it's chosen to focus on this specific issue. You know, one of the causes that I've always thought the church was very good at were things called almshouses, which were basically houses that would be built on church estates for the needy. Not only did they want to spend £100 million on this fund, that they wanted to spend £1 billion on reparations as well. Well, why not spend... 100 million or a billion pounds on a new generation of arms houses as opposed to just helping one group of people, black British people, why not just help all people in need? Alex. Well, I, I just don't understand what the Church of England is trying to do. It's on its deathbed. Congregations have, have reduced. Reduced. I mean, deathbed is maybe... A I little mean, what, <laughs> look, if we look over 20 years, it's dramatically lower than it used to be. And, and, and a lot of criticism from actual Christians come from the, the values that the Church of England are now propagating. And Justin Welby has a lot to answer for, because, you know, not only are we seeing in the news this mass conversion of illegal immigrants to a gay mass system in the UK, but now we're seeing them spending money... And, and 
as Albie actually pointed out correctly, it, it, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't really benefit broader society, it benefits a very small group of people. So I, I just don't know where it's going to end. This committee has also said one million's not enough. 100, it's 100 million, sorry. Um, it's, the, it, church commissioners are now hoping to, for a target of one billion. I mean, I mean it's, it's, a... it's work nonsense, isn't it? You could make the argument that this is charity. Austin Welby's job is to be a virtue, should, virtue signaler, well, is it not? Should charity discriminate? I mean, that's what he's saying. We're only going to give this to people from a specific skin colour or background. I don't think that's it, it very Christian of them. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Sixteen minutes past nine. Good morning to you. Now, it might be Easter Sunday, but society in the UK is becoming increasingly secular. Mm. Churches are finding it harder than ever to have their message heard, and the numbers in congregations are shrinking. But what role should churches be playing in our modern-day society? Our Northern Ireland reporter Doogie Beatty visited an outreach ministry in Belfast that deals with addiction and homelessness. We go out and, and reach people in society who are broken. Uh, many of them living on the streets. And when, when they live on the streets, 99% of them then get addicted to drugs uh, in some way. We bring them in and we offer them hope. Uh, the hope is found in Jesus Christ. Teen Challenge can't change anyone, but Jesus Christ can. Uh, and we, we make that plain to, to, to the folk. Uh, that there is a way out of addiction and there is a way out of the darkness and there is a way out of the pain and that there is hope. Our motto is putting hope within the reach of every addict and the hope, which is the name of this building, the hope is Jesus. Pastor Brian Madden leads Teen Challenge in Belfast and points to the need for a sense of belonging and belief. Everyone who comes in here belongs. They don't necessarily go to church, but they love coming here. They love coming to a Christian organization. They, they never, ever, ever refuse prayer. I just prayed with a young man there five minutes ago. I think it's the first time anyone has prayed for him in his life. When churches such as this one were first built, they were so much more than a place to worship. They projected power and social standing. They were a communication hub for the community. But do they still have the same relevance today? Buildings are, for their very nature, they're buildings that at one time could have fulfilled a, a very important function, and maybe they don't now. So if you think back to the earlier centuries, walking into a, a church building could have been a warm and comfortable space, a place where there was a sense of community, where they didn't have other grand buildings. Imagine walking into a cathedral and the high ceilings, the stained glass windows. The grandeur of it all just spoke of the majesty of God. Many churches are funding the Hope Project, and evangelist Keith Mitchell says churches may change, but their message must remain. So a core principle shouldn't change, and our method should always be one in terms of what is the culture saying around us and how do we engage in that culture in a way that we are, we are living out love and grace, but also we're embracing truth. We're not compromising on truth. And I think the church has a radical message of hope to still bring to the world today, and we do that in lots of different ways. So you might be looking at an old building now and say, you know, how is this relevant? But it's from the cafe at the side, and when people come in here on a Thursday night to worship, they see something contemporary, they see something new, they see something fresh. And in the world today, people need hope, and the church champions hope more than any other religious organization in the world. Doogie BD, GB News, Belfast.
Now, here's something to warm the cockles of your heart. Keepers at a zoo in Leicestershire have welcomed the birth of a Francois Lango, an endangered species of primate. The primate is native to China and North Vietnam, is listed as endangered according to the International Union of Falcons Conservation of Nature Red List, which names the world's most endangered species. Uh, well, let's talk to Director of uh, Conservation at Twycross Zoo, Dr Rebecca Mitchell, who joins us now. Really good to see you this morning. How important is it that this new little life has been born here in the UK? Good morning. Yeah, it's it's super important that we've had this new Francois Langer born here at Twycross Zoo. We're very excited about it. It joins a group of these primates that we have. So we have eight in, in the zoo now. But as you said, these animals are endangered in the wild. Um, scientists think there's less than 2,000 of them left. So everything that we can do to try and support them be that breeding them in zoos and ex situ conservation and also supporting in situ conservation, all that is extremely important for this species. Rebecca, why are they so endangered? So they have quite a specific habitat. So they, they live in tropical forests, um, so limestone cliffs and caves in those tropical forests. And that tropical forest is under threat, like most of the tropical forest across the world at the moment. Um, and that's threatened really from habitat destruction. So changing of the forest for um, areas for agriculture, so clearing for agriculture, logging, uh, wood trapping. But, but also the, the monkeys themselves um, have been trapped quite a lot, either for um, meat or for the pet trade. So they face quite a lot of threats, really, on quite a wide variety of different areas. What's happening globally, then, as part of the conservation effort? I mean, obviously, great success for Twycross, but, but what's happening in other parts of the world? Yeah, so I guess there's there's many zoos around Europe that are keeping the species and trying to keep the species alive in captivity. So there's probably about 50 um, Francois Langer at the moment in European zoos who are all trying to um, maintain a genetically sustainable population of these species for the future. Um, but equally, there's a lot of international support. So Twycross Zoo supports the work of um, Flora and Fauna International, who are a conservation charity who are working with populations of primates in Vietnam. Um, and that would involve things like um, paying rangers to protect species, but also to monitor wild populations over time so that we can really understand what's happening to them. Rebecca, I have to ask the obvious question. Um, why are they orange when they're babies? <laughs> <laughs> They're so cute, aren't they? So, I mean, yeah. it's helpful for us because it means they stand out um, and it means that if visitors come, they can really, you know, get a good chance of seeing them because they'll be that bright, beautiful orange colour until they're about one years old when they turn the black colour like the adults. But really it's because um, within a social group, multiple females within the group will help to care for the youngster. So it's it's beneficial for the animals to be able to see exactly where it is. So it, so it stands out for them so that they can make sure it's all right and give it that extra care that it needs when it's a vulnerable infant. So it, it, is it full on group sort of caring in that sense or, or does mum still take the pivotal role? Because I, I, I have just been wondering how, how mum was doing with her little one. Yeah, mum's doing really, really great. So she's an experienced mother. Um, she's 17. So she's doing really, really well. It's important that obviously we just leave mum and baby together at the moment. So they'll we'll be leaving them kind of within the group for as long as possible, not interfering, just trying to give them as much peace and quiet so that she can really bond with the, with the infant. Um, but yes, there's, there will be other females within the group that will also support um, the, the development of that of that infant. Also, we had two youngsters born in 2022. So I think that's really nice because this new infant is going into a group where there's another two youngsters as well. And we know that play is so important for these social animals. So actually, the, the new youngster will be able to learn to play along with those other two uh, quite young infants as well. Oh, it's fantastic Aww. news. Just very briefly, when, when will the public be able to, to see the little one? So the little one is on show now, so you'll be able to see her. Um, well, I say her. We don't actually know oh. whether or not it's a, a male or a female. We won't actually know for another year or so because it's not really that easy to tell. Okay. Um, so, yes, but visitors can see the infant if they come and, come and visit us over the Easter holidays. Fantastic. Rebecca, really good to see Thank you. Thank you. you. I love ending up on a happy story.
fabulous stuff. Arlene, see you next. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, and sponsors of weather on GB News. Good morning and welcome to your latest GB News weather forecast from the Met Office. Well today, for most of us, we do start the day with some sunshine, but it will turn increasingly cloudy, especially across the south. So we can see the sunshine across many parts of Scotland, Western England and Wales, but further east, it's already cloud moving in. That will spread its way gradually a little bit further westward. So for many central and eastern parts of England, a rather great afternoon to come. Brighter elsewhere across England and Wales, but the best of sunshine really for Scotland and Northern Ireland but here we will see a scattering of showers. Temperatures in the sunshine not doing too badly again 14 or 15 degrees. Into the evening we start to see this band of rain move in from the continent and that really is going to give us a, a fairly wet night across many parts of England. That rain then spreads across parts of Wales too in the small hours of Easter Monday but all the time Scotland and Northern Ireland are a little bit drier here and in any clear skies we will see a touch of frost. So for many parts of England and Wales on Easter Monday, it's going to be a pretty wet affair. Some of the rain will be heavy, giving some fairly poor travelling conditions in places. It does brighten up down towards Devon and Cornwall though, but all the time Scotland and Northern Ireland seeing the best of the weather on Easter Monday. A few spots of rain, but also some decent sunshine. And in the sunshine, highs at 14 or 15, but feeling pretty cool under the rain. Looks like things are heating up. Box Spoilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here or is it more about the toothbrush? Because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, Using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night. You're going to be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But mm. if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over-scrub and over-brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. 